it's so hot. Hello guys, what's up? How are we feeling today? Other than it being incredibly hot. Good morning. All right. Roll the intro. Hello, Kuros and Michaels. Okay, I'm gonna stop saying hi to everyone. I'm dying. Are you dying? Apparently, we broke our record yesterday. 36 degrees in uh, like the city I used to live in before this apartment. That's the hottest it has ever been. The last record was in 2011, I think. Now it has been hotter than ever before. Hey, Sir Gano, what's up? All right, early bros. Today, so I actually just wanted to immediately learn how to play Evoker. Like, I just wanted to do that first and then go through Medalist. But I kind of want to rant about Moonkin for a little while. <laughs> because it has been like a thing on Twitter. And Tattles made this whole post. That was really well written, by the way. And I think I want to quickly go over that. <laughs> Just uh, because. Because we need to save Munkin. I do think, though, that... <laughs> so the thing... Uh... Like, Tattles made this whole post. And it's very, like, like, there's a lot of stuff in there and it's really well written. But I think most of those issues uh, kind of stem from the same problem. And if you fix the initial problem, then I think the other issues might not even be issues anymore. You know what I mean? So I think... Moonkin just needs to have the base issue fixed. And then afterwards, we can talk about the rest of the issues. You know what I mean? Because I think there's no point to actually go super in-depth about the talents and everything. When the base kit is kind of not working correctly. I mean, it's working, but just working very badly. <laughs> so I feel like they have to fix the base first, right? So let's take a look. Yeah, starting off the day correctly with a Munkin rent. Who doesn't love that? <laughs> Here it. Takey, thank you so much for 16 months. Appreciate that. Okay. Alright. So, Tedles made this post. He did put a TLDR at the top, which is nice. Oh, by the way, Kuros, I think we could technically make a video out of this, so... I'm gonna try not to rent for too long, okay? And then maybe we link it in the chat afterwards so I can talk to you, Benny. Yeah, I drink a cafe with a strøhalm, but... I drink a halm and a latte. And now I have to And now... When I have a lefl in my mouth, I have a lefl in my mouth, I have a lefl in my mouth. And now I'm strenger. And now I'm going to have a little bit of 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 a little b
Und dann nehme ich einfach einen Strohhalm, rehe mir einen Strohhalm um und dann trinke ich einen Strohhalm. Hey Nora, what's up? Alright, anyway, let's talk about the Moonkin situation, which, by the way, I think is already a problem on live servers, not only on uh, Alpha. But I think on Alpha, the problem was kind of more noticeable because people assumed that the issues that we have right now in Shadowlands are going to be fixed with the talent system that we get in Dragonflight. And it turns out that the issues that we have right now in Shadowlands are not fixed during Alpha not fixed with the talents. Now, usually I would say, oh, it's just alpha and things can still change and all of that. And that's obviously true. But I think Munkin is a little bit in a specific situation where the problem is not necessarily the talents themselves, but the problem is like the base kit. And we cannot properly look at the talents if the base kit is broken, quote unquote. So that's why um, I'm talking about this right now, because I think Munkin needs specific changes to the baseline kit, or the issues need to be addressed otherwise for the rest of the talents to be able to be judged properly and tested properly. So that's why I'm going over this post, the titles made on the Druid forum, uh, which reflects a lot of the opinions that the Munkins have uh, in general, and I'm gonna give my thoughts to it as well. So at the top you put a TLDR, and I think the TLDR already has a lot of the main issues. Uh, number one, Starfall and our AoE in general need some changing desperately. We should not be limited to one Starfall when it is our spender, our only spender. Now I think this is by far the most important thing, and I honestly think the rest of the problems might somewhat already be resolved if this gets fixed. Now, I've been talking about this for a long time already. Throughout Shadowlands, honestly, I've been talking about this. And it's the fact that Starfall does not stack with the current iteration. Um, and if you have Stellar Drift, it even has a cooldown. Now, that is generally not the issue. But the issue is that Starfall is our only astral power spender on AoE. And obviously that creates a problem where you are on, like you're just like 20 mobs in front of you, you have Starfall up already, and then there's nothing else you can really do with your astral power that makes sense or feels good for that matter. The only other spender that we have is Star Search, which is of course a single target spender. And it obviously just does not feel good to press star search when there's multiple mobs in front of you and it only damages one target. Now, some people might say, oh, but star search has an implemented way of buffing our A through AOE through Starfire, right? Because if you press star search in Lunar Eclipse, then your Starfire does more splash damage, technically, right? The thing is, though, that that is a very weak um, buff and we have an Eclipse system, so that means we're only in Lunar Eclipse that much of our whole five, right? We are 15 seconds in solar eclipse, then there's time outside of eclipse, and then we're 15 seconds in lunar eclipse. And we only have that AoE damage in lunar eclipse, so it's a very short amount of time that we actually spent in that AoE phase. And uh, additionally, our starfire is not very strong, or the splash damage of it is not very strong. And even if it would be stronger, it still wouldn't feel so good because it's a filler and not a spender, right? Starfire, starfire is a filler ability that gives us astral power. So obviously it's not going to be as strong because it, like, it shouldn't be buffed into like an infinite amount to actually make it good on AoE because it's not supposed to be so good as a, as a filler, like as a generator of astral power, right? So that creates the issue where, okay, our two AoE spenders, uh, yeah, our AoE spender uh, is Starfall and our single target spender is Star Surge, buffing our Starfire, but Starfire is whatever, right? So what we need is Starfall to somehow interact m with other spenders somehow, or we need an additional ability that lets us spend Astral Power on AoE, or Starfall needs to be able to be stacked somehow, right? 
I think that is like the main playstyle problem that most Moonkins are just not happy with at the moment in Shadowlands and in Alpha um, because it just feels really bad. And I'm not asking for Moonkins to be buffed or anything. I'm literally just asking for the class to feel good whenever there's an AOE situation. Because right now, it really just doesn't feel good to only have Starfall and nothing else, really, right? Now, there's multiple ways of how you can fix this. I already said some of those fixes, right? Number one, you can make Starfall stack, right? There is an issue with Starfall stacking, though, and it's the fact that Starfall has such a huge radius and it's, of course, incredibly good on spread out targets. And there aren't many other classes in the game that can do damage on spread out targets. So it makes sense that Starfall is a bit weaker uh, compared to other AoEs because Starfall has such a huge radius. And that's okay, right? I'm not saying that it should be even stronger on spread out targets. Now, the problem though is that, of course, a lot of the AoE that we do is stacked AoE, right? like M plus or whatever, all the mobs are stacked up. And then our Starfall in a stacked situation is very underwhelming compared to other classes AOE spells. And the way to fix that would be multiple ways. You can make Starfall do some sort of splash damage when the ads are stacked. So it's stronger on stacked, but weaker on spread AOE. You could make Star Surge do something extra if Starfall is already up. Right? So if Starfall is already running, your Star Search could do splash damage, for example. So you still press Starfall on cooldown, but then when it's up, you still have Star Search to spend to do splash damage on stacked situations. So that would, again, buff our AoE on a stacked situation, but not buff our AoE on a spread a a situation. Then additionally, we could get another AoE spender, just like a completely different ability. For example, it could be Fury of a Loon. Fury of a Loon... Uh, is an astral power generator right now. It's a beam that you cast on a target and it gives us astral power. Technically, they could rework that spell to cost astral power instead of giving us astral power so we can use it as another spender, right? That's also a possibility. Then there's, I mean, there's still many other possibilities on how to fix this. They could say Starfall stacks, but gets like a diminishing kind of effect on spread out targets somehow, right? They could also make our dots somehow do more damage if targets are stacked, if Starfall is running. And then you let it, like, make it possible to stack Starfalls as well, so you can stack this damage. But it wouldn't be so strong on spread out targets because we don't have a good way of applying dots on spread out targets. Right? So there's like multiple ways on how this could be addressed. They just need to pick one of those solutions and apply it, in my opinion to be able to fix this. Balancing is another like thing. I don't think Moonkin necessarily has to be like super strong on, on, spread, on stacked AoE. I just think it has, needs to have something to be able to do stacked damage, right? Then the next main issue that I wanna talk about is the second point that Tattles is making here. Uh, astral power generation on AoE is far too low. With T29, uh, it is fine, but from a base kit perspective, it is problematic. Um, so yeah, our general astral power generation um, was already really low throughout the Shadowlands until we got tier 29. Before that, it was already really bad, and people definitely noticed, especially on AoE situations, that you're spending a lot of time casting fillers, which, again, is generally not too big of an issue, but it becomes a problem when... Uh, you have so many other things that you have to cast as well as a Moonkin to like ramp up your damage, right? You have dots that you need to apply, you have Starfall that you need to cast, you need to enter Eclipses, and then if in addition you also just don't generate a lot of, a lot of, a lot of uh, Astral Power and you need to sit there casting fillers, it takes so long for you to be able to cast the fillers in the first place because you need to do so many other things beforehand. So we need more like passive astral power generation, especially when there's more targets, um, because that's the situation where it feels the worst. On single target, of course, it's not that big of a problem that we cast a lot of fillers. Because on single target, we don't have to do that many things to ramp up our damage. On single target, we only have to apply Moonfire, Sunfire, and then we can do our thing, right? On AoE, it's different. On AoE, we need to dot, which is a lot of globals, right, if you want to apply Moonfire to everything. 
and then do other things as well. And therefore on AOE it just feels a lot worse that you're stuck with only filler cast astral power generation, right? So there are some talents in alpha that give us more astral power generation, but I tested some of the talents and none of them seem like satisfying enough or good enough to compensate, um, you know, the, the lack of astral power generation. And additionally, you have to give up other powers to gain the astral power generation, right? And you could always say, oh, it's a trade-off. You go with more astral power generator talents, but in return, you give up more damage. But then the problem is we gain more astral power generation, but then we can't actually do anything really good with, your, with our astral power on AoE. And therefore, it makes no sense for us to go with astral power generation, right? If we would have an additional way of doing stacked up AoE damage somehow, or we would have an additional spender for our AoE, then it would make sense for us to go with more astral power generators, and then it might feel better. But yeah, right now it feels bad. It feels like we have no astral power. And even if we have astral power, we can't do anything with it. And that combination just feels horrible. Uh, again, especially on AoE, because on single target or in like two targets or whatever, it's fine because we don't need to spend so much time applying our dots and everything, right? But yeah, applying all of your dots and then not generating any astral power during that time frame just feels horrible. It feels like we have the longest ramp up time ever. And then once we finally get a star fall down, the mobs are half dead already. And then what do we do? Like, it just feels really bad from a playstyle perspective. And then the next point is just like the same thing as I just talked about. Dots still suck to press on AoE. This could be alleviated by tu uh, tuning up shooting stars to old levels. Now, shooting stars, I do think, um, could technically be a problem if it scales too highly. Because um, shooting stars, of course, um, was changed and has now a diminishing, diminishing return. Um, which I think was added to stop the like infinite scaling issue. Because there are some classes that whenever they get infinite scaling, they become really overpowered. A uh, very good example for this is Destro Warlock. Destro Warlock has this kind of scaling that the more targets there are, the like uh, more like shards and like generators you get. And not just like additive, but like multiplicative. And that is the issue, right? And I think shooting stars might have a very similar problem if it doesn't have a diminishing return. I think it was pretty obvious at the end of Legion that we generated so much astral power on huge pulls that we would just spam Starfall on GCD, kind of like um, Dastro Warlock spams Rain of Fire on GCD at the moment in uh, on live servers. And I think that's the issue with shooting stars. That's why they changed it. But I do think it's too weak at the moment. And I think that DR that they added should be... like I'm not saying they should completely remove the DR, but I'm saying it should be buffed a little bit. Because right now, shooting stars might as well just not exist uh, even in terms of astral power generation because you can barely feel the astral power being added whenever there's more mobs, right? So I do think shooting stars shouldn't be like super OP and give you like a million astral power when there's 50 mobs. But at the same time, I do think shooting stars should be noticeable and actually give you more astral power on AoE, right? Like I think if there's five, six mobs that have dots on them, you should, don't, you should definitely notice the increase in astral power generation, right? So, and right now you don't. So that's something that should be addressed. And then again, diminishing returns feel oppressive in a few abilities like Fear Balloon and Shooting Stars. We already, I already mentioned this now. And then the talent tree could use some node movement. Now, I don't want to actually go into the talent tree at all. And the reason why is because I think that this, the AoE issue and the astral power issue um, are like a base problem that Mookin has right now that I'm not really sure can be perfectly addressed with the current talents that we have. In fact, I don't think, I know it can't, right? There's just no talents that fix these problems. Um, so I think that this has to be addressed first and then afterwards we can reevaluate the talent tree because uh, right now, the talent tree just makes, like, 
I think the talent tree is bad, the way it is right now, but mainly because of this issue. So therefore, it's like really hard for me to talk about the talent tree in a like a like in, in like a good way, because I think that without addressing these two issues with our AOE and our astral power generation, I don't think that a talent tree makes sense to even like discuss and give feedback on. And that's why I'm not going to talk about it at all. Uh, there's definitely some things with the talent tree I could mention, and it's basically um, certain talents having a position that makes no sense. Like, for example, there's Starfall, which clearly is AoE on the left, and then that talent leads into a single target choice, which I don't think is very good, right? Because most classes have their AoE and their single target kind of divided, uh, which makes sense. And in our talent tree, it feels like we have some AoE on one side into single target, and then we have some single target on the other side into some AoE, which I don't think makes very much sense, right? But then at the same time, depending on how they address the Starfall issue, if at all, I think this could be solved, right? Because, for example, um, as I mentioned earlier, this could be fixed if Star Search would have splash damage whenever Starfall is up. And then I think that some of the talent positions would make a lot more sense than what they do now, right? So if that's a solution that Blizzard chooses to go with, then I think that the talents might make even sense how they are right now, right? For example, the position of where OI is. Um, like here, we have Dreambinder and um, OI, Honest Intuition. And right now it leads into it through Starfall. So you have Starfall, Starfall into the Blessings, into OI and Dreambinder. And I think those two talents are very heavily single target at the moment. Like very heavily single target. But if they would change the issue that we have with the AoE by, as I said, making Star Search do splash damage whenever Starfall is up, then all of a sudden these talents might not actually be that bad anymore. Right? Because then you... For example, Dreambinder would all of a sudden have a completely different value for AoE. Because then you would cast Starfall, you already get one Dreambinder stack, and then you cast Star Surge because it's a splash damage, and you stack up your Dreambinder. It would actually be a damage gain on AoE, right? So that's why I think <laughs> that it's really, really hard to just give any sort of feedback on these talents without having our base issue resolved in some way. So yeah. That's all I have to say. Fix Starfall or fix AoE in general and fix Astral Power Generation. And then we can look at the rest of the talents. <laughs> Alright. Um, sorry, I missed a bunch of subs. Thank you so much for 14 months. I just appreciate that. Hello, Tattles. Thanks for 56 months. Good morning, good morning. And thanks for 40 months, Odessa. What's up? Concise into the point, great video. Oh my god, how long did I talk? Did I talk super long? I also rambled a lot, but I think that I always do that, so. <laughs> I also keep repeating myself constantly. The amount of times I said they should uh, make Star Search do splash damage, probably like three times. <laughs> but that's fine. <laughs> but let me scroll up to see what some of you guys said. Would you be okay with a new AoE spender? Uh, preferably, I would not want to have a new AoE spender. Like, I think that's... I wouldn't mind it. Like, if Fear of a Loon would be an AoE spender or something, I wouldn't necessarily mind it. But at the same time, I think the issue can be resolved without adding a new spender. And I think that would be preferable. I think it would be better if they do something with Starfall or Star Search rather than giving us a new spender. Like, that would just be the better solution. It's, it's, we don't have another ability th to think about, and it doesn't have to have another interaction, and so on, right? What about Haste and Starfall? Yeah, Haste and Starfall is an issue, but not necessarily... I think Haste, interacting with Starfall, is not that important if it doesn't stack. If Starfall stacks, then I think 
haste affecting Starfall is a lot more important because then we would cast Starfall a lot more and then that would make haste more useless, which sucks, right? But if you only cast Starfall once every blue moon because it doesn't stack, then the fact that it's not affected by haste, I don't think it's that big of a deal. I think it would be fine. So depending on how they fix the issue, if they fix it at all, I think um, haste doesn't necessarily have to interact with Starfall. Unless they make it stack, then I think it probably should. Surely you get the best of both worlds, having spread AoE, which no other class really has, and good stacked AoE, so you don't lose anything. Yeah, I personally think that classes should not... Um, so I made a post about this a long time ago um, on Twitter. Well, a long time ago, like a while ago. And I personally think that every class, every spec in the game, should have the capabilities of doing stacked AoE. No matter what else you can do. Because there, like, there are niche situations in the game that not every class is good at, right? But there are some situations in the game that every class is good at. For example, single target damage. Single target damage is something that Blizzard tries to make every class somewhat balanced in, right? Because it makes sense, because it's the most important thing in raiding is single target. So, of course, it makes sense that every class should be good at it, right? Now, the thing with stacked AoE is that in the past, I don't think it was very important that every class can do stacked AoE, right? Because um, the main PvE portion of the game was raiding, and in raiding, there weren't very many situations where you actually needed stacked AoE. So it wasn't important that every class is good at it. It was fine if only some player, some classes could do stacked AoE. That's, that was totally okay. Because you didn't need it all the time. It was more of a niche, right? But the problem is now that M, like M+, plus is such an important part of the game. Like, I, don't, I think even more players are playing M+, plus than there are people raiding. Right? Overall. And in M+, it's just true that stacked AoE is the main part of it. I think we can all agree that that's a thing, right? Stacked AoE is the most important thing in Mythic+. Plus. No matter what they try to do, like Blizzard tried to give us affixes, to give us dungeons, to kind of prevent us from always doing AoE pulls, but it never worked. People always figure out a way on how to do AoE pulls, and that will just always be the fastest way to deal with the dungeon. So that's why stacked AoE is the most important thing by far for M+. And that's why I think that every spec should be able to do stacked AoE, because it's not a niche anymore. It used to be a niche, but now it's not. Now it's a, the most, by far the most common AoE that we have in the game is stacked AoE. And I don't think there should be classes that are, that are left behind and that they're just not good at stacked AoE. That just makes no sense to me. I still think that there should be other niches that not every class is good at, right? I think it's totally fine if there's a class that is much better at two target cleave than others, for example. I also think it's totally fine if there's a class that's much better at spread out AoE than others, because spread out AoE is a very niche scenario that doesn't happen very often. Now, for Moonkin specifically, they are really good at, at spread out AoE, right? But does that mean that we should be bad at stacked AoE because we're good at spread AoE? I personally don't think so. I personally also don't think that other classes that have a niche should be bad at stacked AoE either, right? If there's a class that is really good at two target clay, for example, I don't think that should mean that they're bad at stacked AoE. Because again, stacked AoE is not a niche in my mind. Stacked AoE is a, the most common AoE scenario that we have in a game. So I think every single spec in a game should be able to do stacked AoE in like a somewhat balanced way. And that's why I am asking for Moonkins to be able to do stacked AoE. And I understand that we have Starfall, which is good on spread AoE. And I personally would give up spread AoE in a heartbeat to gain stacked AoE. Like, if I could choose, if Blizzard would call me and be like, hey, Nagura, what if we make Starfall like a lot smaller, but we buff it a lot and you can stack it? Well, then I would like immediately say yes. 
Chris, I don't necessarily care about the spread out AoE as much as I care about the stacked AoE. Because again, the spread AoE is a new situation that happens not very often, right? So yeah, it's nice and all that we are good at spread AoE. But I would give that up instantly if I could be better at stacked AoE, right? And I think a lot of classes feel this way. Because, again, stacked AoE is much more common than spread AoE, right? And I'm all... Like, Moonkins are not asking for it to be, like, the best at stacked AoE either, right? Like, I'm not saying, hey, Moonkin should be the best in Implas or whatever. Like, that's not what I mean. I just mean we should have the capabilities to do stacked AoE. Because we at the moment, we just don't, right? And I think that's an issue. Because it's, it's it has a lot to do with um, gameplay as well. It's not necessarily about numbers. It's more about the fact that I would like to enjoy playing my class in a stacked AoE situation. Like I would like to have buttons to press and things to do. But we just don't. On spread AoE, we have things to do, right? Like if all the targets are spread out across the whole room, well, yeah, then we press Starfall, we dot the mobs up, like we have things to press and things to do and it feels good. But whenever things are stacked up, then all of a sudden we don't know what to do with ourselves. Like our whole rotation, our whole like kit, our abilities that we have are just made, are not made for stacked AoE at all. And we're just missing stuff. Like it feels like we're just missing something to do. You know, it's, it's, like, it's like a gameplay issue. It just feels bad, you know? Thank you so much for 40 months of this day again. I appreciate that. I hope you're doing well. Hey, Emily. How about something like Moonfire spreading to stack targets when you have Starfall up or something? That does not solve the problem with spending Astral Power on AoE, but it kind of lets you do other things than nothing at least. Yeah, I mean... I do think that there's just, like, numerous things that would solve the issue. And that would be, like, definitely a cool thing as well, right? Because I think sitting there having to apply a million dots definitely doesn't feel good at all. So having some sort of, like, solution to apply your dots quicker would also be already nice. And we have something like that on the PTR already, though, like on Alpha. We have a talent called Syzygy that basically applies all dots in a targeted area. It's not implemented currently, so we can't test it. But it only happens like when you press your cooldowns, which like every three minutes you can apply Moonfires to all targets, which like it's not that good considering our dots are not very good. Yeah, so some people say some people say that Starfall should just be stackable. And I think Starfall, like, that's, it's, the problem is it's not such a, uh, such a simple solution, right? Because if you make Starfall stackable, it creates other issues because of the huge radius Starfall has. And that's why I'm suggesting other solutions to not make the class imbalanceable. Because, okay, let me... <laughs> Let me open up the paint. <laughs> so there's clearly an issue with Starfall having this radius, right? Like if there's targets that are spread around the room like this, which again, rarely ever happens, but if it happens, then Munkin, I'm just gonna say random numbers now just for comparison, okay? So let's say Munkin does like 10K DPS. In this situation, okay? Now, if you take another class that doesn't have any sort of spread out AoE mechanic at all, then maybe that class only does like 5k DPS, okay? So that is already, that makes Moonkin obviously really strong for this situation, right? Now, when you have a much smaller AoE situation where all the targets are stacked, then the problem is that Moonkin still does the same damage, kind of. 
we do a little bit more. I, I, I'm exaggerating right now, but we basically do the same damage, okay? So we still do like 10k DPS here, right? Well, this class here that did 5k on spreads, they have stacked AoE and then they do something like 20k DPS, okay? Now the problem is, if you make Starfall stackable, then it will buff this number, but also this number, okay? And the problem is only this number should be addressed because this number is already good or better than everyone else already, right? So by making Starfall stackable, you don't... Like, you create a situation where it, it's just impossible to balance numbers, right? Because the only thing that needs to be addressed is this. This spread AoE does not have to be addressed because it's already good, right? And the only way to address this only is by giving us some baseline change, right? Like, either Starfall does something when targets are stacked, or your Star Search splash, the splash damage when Starfall is up. Like, you need to... Basically, there's numerous things you could do. You just have to keep in mind that you should not be buffing this number, yeah? The change that needs to happen needs to only buff this number and not this number. So clearly buffing Starfall or making Starfall stackable is not like the a real solution because uh, it addresses both numbers equally. So that's, that's why I'm suggesting all of these different things with, uh, you know, Star Search having splash damage or uh, Starfall being stackable, but having a bigger effect on stack targets than... Because technically you can make Starfall stackable. You just need to make it so it has an additional effect on stack targets, right? So if Starfall stacks, you could nerf the damage by a lot. Let's say you nerf the damage by 50% or whatever, okay? But if they're stack targets, then it does something special, you know, like... It does splash damage around it, or it makes shooting stars proc more when pe when targets are stacked, or uh, I don't know, like basically anything that does more damage on stacked targets but doesn't affect spread targets. <laughs> what about giving up the dot damage of Starfall but make it spammable? Just like you would spam Star Search on single target, a big AoE hit with no dot. Wait, what do you mean by dot damage? Oh, you're saying that it should just do its, the damage instantly as you press it? So you press Starfall and it just does like burst damage? Oh. That would solve the problem and still... I don't think that would solve the problem though. Because if Starfall just in immediately does its damage, it still does the same DPS here than it does here, right? Like, that doesn't solve the issue at all, in my opinion. Right? Because then it still does 10k DPS here and 10k DPS here. It doesn't matter if it does it over time or instantly. Thanks for two months, Kigarina. What's up? Make Starfall do more damage to targets close to you? Mealy Moonkin? Dude, honestly, that's not even that bad of an idea. I like that. See, that, that would be another issue. Like, again, uh, like, there's so many ways on how you could solve this, honestly. And they just need to pick one, right? I think, I think uh, increasing damage if you're close makes a lot of sense, right? Because then... In this situation, in a spread out situation, you cannot be close to all targets, right? But in a stacked AoE situation, you can be close to all targets. So that would kind of solve the situation a little bit. It would require a moon can sustain melee, which is a bit weird, but you don't have to make it melee range. Like you can make it like, I don't know, 20 yards, 15 yards, I don't know. If Starfall was an instant burst, you could constantly spend AP on it without capping. It would be more DPS. 
Yeah, if Starfall was an instant burst, it would obviously be stackable. So it that's basically just making Starfall stackable, but without addressing the stacked versus spread issue. Reduce Starfall's radius and cost by 50%. If Starfall is reapplied, any remaining damage will be added to the new Starfall. Yeah, that could that that's a good idea, Mykos. Reduce Starfall's radius and cost by 50%. If Starfall is reapplied, any remaining damage will be added to the new Starfall. Yeah, that's actually a really good... That could be a talent, right? Yeah, I like that. That could be... Um, they could rework Stellar Drift, technically. Huh, that would be a very good idea, actually, for, for Stellar Drift. Right? Because right now we have a problem with Stellar Drift. Stellar Drift lets you cast while moving while Starfall is up. Which, of course, creates an issue that it's really OP if you have Starfall up constantly, right? Because then you can just permanently cast while moving, which is obviously too broken, right? But it wouldn't be so broken if Starfall is like a targeted ability. I mean, it still would be broken if it's smaller radius, right? Fuck. Yeah, maybe that wouldn't solve that issue that much. <laughs> yeah, Stellar Drift is just a, a whole issue, honestly. I don't know what they should do with Stellar Drift. It's, um... Like, all of the solutions that I mentioned don't fix the Stellar Drift problem, though. Yeah. Like, even if you do the whole Star Search idea that I had, where if you have Starfall up, then Star Search does splash damage. It still doesn't fix the Stellar Drift problem, because right now, Stellar Drift puts a cooldown on Starfall. And that would be really awkward if Star Search just splash damage during Starfall. Right? Like, that would just be really awkward. It would be... Like, you could play around it, but it would be weird, because then outside of your Starfall windows you still wouldn't be able to do anything with the astral power, right? Which might be fine-ish. Remove the cast while moving part. I mean, yeah, if they remove the cast while moving part, then it solves the whole issue, right? The thing, though, is that I think a lot of Moonkin players like the cast while moving, and I don't think they want to fully remove it. Right? And... I personally don't necessarily need the castle moving effect. Like, if they would remove it to fix the issues, then so be it, right? But I also understand why they maybe don't want to remove it, because it is kind of like a... I think Stellar Drift, or the fact that you can cast while moving, um, is definitely like a Moonkin thing that people like. And I guess removing that might make people very angry. <laughs> And I think it's mainly just an issue because they reworked Starfall, because if you guys remember in Legion and in BFA, our Starfall was a targeted AoE that you placed on the floor. And then Stellar Drift made so much more sense, because you could only cast while moving while inside your Starfall. So that made it so you couldn't always cast while moving when Starfall was up, you actually had to stand in it, right? So that meant you have to be like in melee range to be able to cast. If you stand outside of your Starfall, you can't cast while moving. And now the problem is, of course, that they reworked Starfall and now it's attached to your character. So you're always inside your Starfall. And that kind of removed the, the risk with it, right? And therefore it became too OP. And now it's, like, really hard to solve this problem without, like, either completely removing it or it being really OPM. <laughs> we like to cast on moving because Venthyr showed up. Before that, we played the whole BFA without Cell Drift, at least. It didn't feel that bad doing AoE. Oh, I disagree. BFA was horrible. 
I think BFA was absolutely horrendous for AoE as well. <laughs> because we casted Star Surge until eight targets. <laughs> like we literally didn't press Starfall ever and it felt horrible. <laughs> I hated it. But yeah, like, I don't think we need Stellar Drift. Like, I don't think we need to cast Realm Ring. I do think... Like, I think Star, uh, the whole Stellar Drift thing was mostly enjoyable when... <laughs> when we used it on single target or on, like, raiding encounters. Because in, in M+, plus, casting while moving is not even that important, honestly. Because... In an AoE situation, you're casting so many instant spells anyway that you're incredibly mobile no matter what you do, right? Like, you have to, like, Moonfire, 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 Sunfire, you know? Like, you're casting so many instants, you barely ever have to stand still and actually cast. So the, the casting while moving was not that important. But um, I always thought it's an interesting decision to make if you cast Star Search or Star Fall in, like, a single target situation just to... Because, like, I, I, th I think that's, like, a really cool thing that Moonkin has to make that decision. Because if you have Stellar Drift and you're on a single target boss and you know you're going to have to move, then you can either make the decision of, oh, I'm going to pool my Astral Power and I'm going to cast Star Surges while moving. Or you cast Starfall so you can continue to cast while moving. But obviously Starfall does less damage on single target than Star Search does. So you're basically sacrificing your damage to cast while moving. And I always thought that's like a really cool like flavor choice that the class had or has that makes it somewhat interesting. And removing that is fine. Like I'm not saying we need this to be in the game. Like if they would remove it, so be it, right? But I do think it's like a cool like flavor thing that Moonkin has. Kind of like sacrificing your own damage to cast while moving. Because um, sometimes it's a damage loss to cast Starfall. Um, but sometimes it might like, be a damage gain, right? And that's a decision you need to... Like you need to look ahead. You need to look into the future and figure that out for yourself, you know? Thank you so much for 29 months, Crack. What's up? <clears throat> okay, listen, if you guys disagree with the fact that every class should be good at stacked AoE, then so be it. But I strongly believe that every single spec in the game should be good at stacked AoE. I very strongly believe that. And it's, it's because of M+, really. Because, like, M+, is such a main part of the game, right? And clearly, they haven't really looked at M+, balancing at all. Which has been fine, because it's incredibly hard, if not impossible, to perfectly balance M+, damage. Like, I know that, right? But I think they should at least attempt it by giving every class the capability of doing stacked AoE. I think stacked AoE should be balanced the same way as they balance single target damage. And some people are saying, oh, but not every class should be good at everything. And I agree. But only when it comes to niche situations. Because we, we still have niche situations that don't happen all the time, right? Like, spread AoE is a niche situation. Two target cleave is a, is a niche situation. Council fights are a niche situation. Burst AoE is a niche situation. Burst single target is a niche situation, right? Like, there's so many niche kind of damage situations that happen, but happen rarely, right? 
And if a class is better at that than another class, then that's fine. Because if it only happens once in a, in a blue moon, then so be it, right? The thing though is stacked AoE and single targets are by far the most common damage situations in PvE. Like it's not even close, yeah? This is basically M+, plus, and this is single target, yeah? And that's why I think that every class should be able to be somewhat balanced for both of these situations. All the other situations, they can be imbalanced and it's fine. I don't care if a Frost Mage does double my DPS on two targets compared to me. Like, I don't care, right? Because how many times do you have two targets and two targets only? Like, rarely, right? It happens, but not very often. And I don't care if, if there's a council fight and an Affliction Warlock does triple my DPS. Well, so be it. Because a council fight happens once every three raids, right? But this situation is not rare. It's literally 90% of like all M plus pools is this. That's the same reason why single target DPS is being balanced, because that's the most important thing in, in the raid, right? What the hell am I looking at? Sorry, I'm just uh, drawing. <laughs> so yeah, if you disagree with that, if you think that that people or that specs should be doing by default less damage in a plus, then that's your opinion, right? I just strongly disagree. <laughs> When you are good at spread AoE, you should be weaker on single target or stacked AoE. I very strongly disagree. For the same reasons that I just mentioned. Why? Have you not been listening for the past five minutes? <laughs> I literally just explained it. <laughs> Let me draw this again for you. Okay, listen. So let's say <laughs> this is a this is a damage situation, a random one. Okay, let's say this is single target or AoE or whatever. So th these are all the different kinds of scenarios that you could encounter in PvE. Okay. So let's say this is single target, this is two target cleave, this is three target cleave, this is AoE, this is spread AoE, this is stacked AoE, or whatever, yeah? And now I'm gonna put the percentages of the amount of times they are occurring, okay? So this is, let's assume, this situation happens 90% of all raid bosses, okay? Is this situation. This situation happens 2.5% of the times. This situation happens 10% of the time. This situation happens 0.5% of the time. This situation happens 80% of the time. This situation 2%. And this situation 5%. Okay? Now, don't you think it's a bit stupid if there's a class that is good at this, so let's say um, Rogue is like really good at this D situation, okay? Do you think it makes sense that the Rogue should be worse at this situation compared to all other classes? <laughs> Does that logically make sense to you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Okay, the answer is no, right? That is why I am suggesting that every class should be good at this situation that happens 90% of the time. Yes? And all class should be good at situation E as well. So A and E, every class should be able to do well in, right? <laughs> and then situation D, not every class has to do well in, right? Maybe only one 
maybe only two specs in a game can do this kind of damage. That's fine, right? And then 2.5%, maybe four specs can do this, you know? And everyone else is bad at it. Maybe 10%, maybe it's like six specs, you know? Whatever. That is what I'm suggesting. But what if the class is best at A by a long mile for entire patch at a time? That's a balancing issue. Like, so here's the thing, right? Blizzard can decide what they balance and what they don't balance. So if there's a class that is number one on situation A, that means that Blizzard made a mistake, yeah? That doesn't mean that they should automatically be bad at this. Because the goal... The goal for the situation A is that every class is somewhat balanced, yeah? If there's a class that does much more damage than everyone else in situation A, then they should fucking nerf it for situation A. That's what the solution is in that moment. The solution is not to keep them OP in situation A and then nerf them in situation E. Like, that makes no sense, right? It's like, oh, a class is really OP in A. So what are we going to do about that? Hmm. Oh, we're going to nerf it for situation B, C, D, E, F, and G. Like. <laughs> Obviously, they should just be nerfed for situation A as a result, right? When a raid has a situation D for just one tier, the community will cry that Rogue is OP and needs nerfs. Um, yeah, but that might, might actually be warranted. Like, if Blizzard creates a raid, so these percentages obviously are random numbers, um, but it is possible that Blizzard creates a raid where instead of this situation happens 0.5% of the time, it happens like 60% of the time all of a sudden, right? And then if only two specs are good at that, then that of course is the problem. And it should be nerfed. Because in the end, it always depends on how many times the situation happens. Because obviously, if one single spec can only do situation F, it's fine if it happens 2% of the time, but if it, if it all of a sudden happens 80% of the time, then obviously it's not okay anymore and it needs to be nerfed. Then they can fix, like once the tier is over, they can revert the nerf or change it again afterwards, right? I disagree. You can't expect to do blade storm damage with an affliction lock or a moonkin, but in a one minute AoE long fight, they should do more or less damage all the classes. Well, then you don't disagree, then you agree with me. Right now, you're not. Like, I was saying that stacked AoE damage should be balanced. I didn't say burst stacked AoE should be balanced, because there's a difference, right? I think burst AoE versus like sustained AoE can still be a thing, right? Like those are two different situations. Both together, they are stacked AoE, right? So I think this should be balanced. Stacked AoE, that's like situation E, basically, yeah? But that doesn't mean that everyone should have burst AoE. Because it makes sense that different classes can do different things. Some classes do the damage really fast and others do it a bit slower. And that's fine, I think. Right? So making a difference here makes sense as long as in the end it's somewhat balanced. Right? Man, I'm so good at drawing uh, paint images. 
the... <laughs> Good morning, Greggy, what's up? They should also not release a tier that has the same rare niche in every boss. Yeah, that would be a very bad thing to do. Yeah. Like, usually Blizzard tries to avoid having multiple niches repeat themselves in a raid encounter. Like, they're really good at not having that happen, right? I can't really think of a raid tier where there was, like, a certain niche that happened, like, all the time or something. Mm-mm. Question is what it means to be good at when the best class stands for 100% performance, the best class for the job? Should the others be 99%, 95%? Yeah, I mean, that's that's just a balance. Like, obviously, the ideal scenario, if we look at the situation more in depth, like if you look at situation E or situation A, right now, A is obviously single target, okay? <laughs> so for single target, I think the when they balance it, they, of course, should strive to have the least difference between the highest and the lowest number, right? So if if some if the best class does 10k DPS, then the lowest number of DPS shouldn't be like 5k or whatever, right? It should be more closer to like 9k. Like the difference between the best and the worst should be as low as possible. Right? And right now the problem is that with stacked AOE with situation E it currently seems like the best class is like 100k DPS and the worst class is like 30k DPS okay like that's what it feels like of course they're just random numbers but yeah and this gap I think needs to be closed a lot right because right now it's it's not being closed at all <laughs> That's why I'm saying that this situation should be balanced the same way as this situation is being balanced. And all the other situations, they can have a bigger gap, that's fine. In my mind, at least. Because if you, if you balance all situations, like if every class is good at spread AoE, and every class is good at two target cleave, and every class is good at console fights or whatever, then every class ends up being the same. And that's a bit boring, right? Um... So that's why I think that only those two situations should be balanced because they are the most common ones in the game by far. Closing the gap sounds better than making every one good at E. But it it means the same thing, you just didn't understand it then. When I say every class should be good at single target, then I mean that every class should be like balanced toward like, to each other, closing the gap between the best and the worst. That, that is literally what I, what I mean. That's what balancing means. Right? <laughs> balancing means that you're closing the gap. <laughs> hey, Roddy, what's up? <laughs> Didn't Final Fantasy XIII have pretty uh, tight DPS range from best to worst? I honestly don't know. I think uh, Final Fantasy XIV has really good balancing, but it's honestly also not fair to compare Final Fantasy XIV balancing with WoW balancing, because Final Fantasy XIV only balances single targets, and every fight is single targets. So, so they make it really easy for themselves to balance the game, which is smart, right? The thing is, in WoW, it's not that easy because we have a lot more situations than just single targets, and that obviously makes balancing a lot harder. Like, that's just, by def it's by default much harder to balance WoW than it is to balance Final Fantasy XIV. Yeah, I agree. If if World of Warcraft would be full single target, then it would also be really balanced. In fact, and this is like a hot take, I guess. 
But I think that the, the people that balance the classes are honestly not actually that bad at balancing, I think. It's just like really hard to balance the game and then certain situations they just don't balance. Because like people might say stuff like, oh, they're horrible at balancing, look at M+, right? And I don't think they're bad at balancing M+, they're just not balancing it. <laughs> like they're not even attempting to balance it. And that's the problem, right? Like, I don't think they're doing a bad job. They're just not doing it at all. Like, that's the issue. <laughs> they're just not addressing it. If they would actually try to balance stacked AoE, I think they would probably do a decent job at it. Because most of the time, single target is actually decently balanced. Like, it's not that horrible, as most people make it out to be. Sometimes it is bad. But they also make it really hard on themselves with, like adding a million borrowed powers and then there's tier set and a second legendary and there's covenants and blah 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 right and then they obviously make it really really hard to balance and then additionally they create so many different situations in the rates as well that the numbers like basically let's say you would perfectly balance single targets that still doesn't mean that the rate would be balanced properly because if you look at Sepulchre, the first ones, how many, like, actual single target fights do we really have? Not that many, right? So even if single target would be perfectly balanced, that might still mean that the rate is not balanced at all. That might still mean that there's classes that are much better than others. Because there's only, like, two single target fights, right? So... How do you balance it with player skill? I don't think player skill is relevant. I think classes should always be balanced depending on the best possible rotation, yes. Well, not necessarily the best, but like the reasonably best. Because I think um, like some people have this opinion that a class that is harder to play should do more damage. And I think that is 100% not what they should do because you don't choose the difficulty of your class. And additionally, the difficulty of your class is pretty subjective, like who decides what's, more, what's harder than others, right? But even if you could decide, like even if you could say, okay, this class is the most difficult in the game, this is the second most difficult, this is the third. Like, even if you could do that, it's, like, I think it makes no sense to balance around that. Because what if my class used to be really hard, and then it did a lot of damage, but then all of a sudden they made it slightly easier to play, because the set bonus was easier or whatever, and now it does, now I do less damage, because they chose to make my class easier to play. You know what I mean? Like... I don't think you should be taxed on something that you don't have a choice on. It's the same argument with Surrender to Madness Shadow Priest. Surrender to Madness Shadow Priest used to be really OP at the start of Legion. And people loved playing it though, and it did a lot of damage. And then they wanted to nerf it, and people kept complaining but it's so high risk, so I should be doing a lot of damage because I'm risking to die, right? Like, if I make a mistake, I literally die. So I should be doing more damage, right? And I understand the notion because it makes sense technically, but then every other class should also have the option to play a higher risk playstyle with a higher reward, right? Because if only one class has the option to play a high risk, high reward playstyle, then that's not fair, right? What if I want to have Surrender to Madness as a Moonkin? What if I want to have a high risk, high reward playstyle, but I can't, I don't have the option to do so, right? <laughs> and that is obviously not really fair.
Okay, I'm not gonna have a Final Fantasy XIV versus WoW discussion right now. Play whatever the fuck you want, okay? It's a preference thing. Like, I never- I will never understand why people try to convince others of their own completely subjective opinion. It's like, I like apples. And then the other person is like, no, I like bananas. You should like bananas. And it's like, I don't care if you like bananas, I like apples. Shut the fuck up, you know? <laughs> like, who the fuck cares? Just eat your fucking banana and shut up, you know? Yeah, but if every class has surrendered to madness, it makes all class alike. Yeah, I agree. That's why I think it shouldn't just it should just not exist in the first place, right? I think high risk, high reward play stars are, are fun. But again, I think it's not fair if not everyone has it, so they should just not have it. Or at least not in a in a way that you would like play the, all the time. If it's just like a niche thing, then it still makes sense to me. Like, Surrender to Madness being, like, a very niche kind of talent that you take in, like, very rare situations where you need, like, a lot of execute damage or whatever, then it's fine. But if you take it all the time and you're always doing a shit ton of damage, then obviously it's not, like, it just shouldn't be existing at that point. What's the new meta? What new meta? Master Tang, what is your question? <laughs> this person comes into my stream, first time chatter, says, what's the new meta, Nagura? Then I didn't answer within 30 seconds. And now they're spamming the same thing 10 times in a row. What, like, what does it even mean, what's the new meta? For what? The meta for what? For a 3v3 arena? You want me to tell you what to play in 3v3? <laughs> or you want to know what my favorite fruit is? Because <laughs> it's definitely not bananas. <laughs> also not apples, so... What is my favorite fruit? Hmm. I like peaches. Strawberries. I also like raspberries. Hmm. <laughs> grapes? Huh? I mean, I do like grapes because they turn into wine. But I don't actually like grapes that much, like, as the actual fruit, you know? <laughs> but they do make wine, so that's great. <laughs> they remove meta from Demon Hunter, who's the new meta? <laughs> But here's my 37 page dissertation on why bananas are better than apples. <laughs> not really matching towels, not really. Wait, what's this, Ella? Oh, you guys look so cute. I'm a very big fan. Oh, I like the elephant. Also, what is this? A fucking Pokemon? <laughs> I made wine in Surumar one time when unlocking Volpera. Dude, I made wine in Surumar so many times. All right, so we're we're trying to learn um, Evoker, specifically Preservation, which seems pretty complicated so far. I've looked through some of the talents yesterday, and it seemed somewhat, somewhat complicated. So we're gonna try to figure this out. All right, so it looks like. One of the main abilities that um, 
At least this is what I've gathered. I'm not 100% sure about this. I'm just, like, making shit up, okay? So I think one of the main abilities that Evoker has, or the... I'm just gonna call him Green Dragon. So Green Dragons have, like, um... Reversion. I think this is, like, one of their main abilities, and it's a hot. It's very much like Rejuvenation, except it has a cooldown. Um... 7.5 seconds, so it's not too long of a cooldown. And, yeah, so I think this is, like... This is a pretty good spell that they're probably gonna use on CD, I think. This spell. Then. The other main ability that they have, I think, is uh, Emerald Blossom. And it's a baseline ability. Every evoker has this. And it's basically a targeted spell that creates, like, a, a bloom around you. Like this. And, yeah, this actually doesn't have a cooldown, right? Oh, no, it does. Never mind. Why does it not say the cooldown? Oh, it's because it's cost essences, so it doesn't have a cooldown, yeah? Oh, wait! Oh, this is so cool! I didn't know this is happening! Oh my god, I love this so much. You know they have this rune system, yeah? Where you have these so-called essences? And they charge up over time. And some of your spells cost essences. And you see how this spell, Emerald Blossom, does not have a cooldown. But if I don't have enough essences to cast it, it tells me how long it takes for the essences to fill up. That is such a cool thing. Is that the same with other... Like with DK or something? Is that how it works with DK? You know what I'm trying to say? See, right now it says 3 seconds, because that's how long it takes for me to get another essence. And that's just 12 seconds, because that's how long it takes for me to get 3. DK runes, yeah, really? Dude, I love that. That is so good. Big fan. Hmm. Okay, that's really nice. So yeah, I think the main, the main like, spender is probably this uh, Emerald Blossom thing. And then Reversion doesn't cost Essences, so you're just gonna cast on cooldown. And then Echo is probably like your main, like, in-between, like, filler spell. Because Echo, um, is a heal. But it also causes your next healing spell to cast an additional time on the tar on the ally. So basically, if I cast... Echo, and then I cast, uh, the Bloom thing... Then it will basically cast it twice. Or if I cast Echo and then I cast um, the Hot, then it will cast it twice as well. See, now I have two Hots. One Reversion and one Reversion. So yeah, I think you're just gonna, like, rotate spells a lot. You're just gonna cast Echo into Reversion, Echo into Bloom, Echo into whatever. Like, it's kind of like an alternating thing you probably do. No, maybe not always, but um, most of the time if you can afford it. Yeah, it costs two essences. So if you can afford to cast Echo, you would cast it. Um, of course, if you... Like, it's... It obviously depends if you want to echo the ability or not, right? Because if you just want to heal one single person uh, with like an instant heal or something, or like a single target heal, then there might not be any need to duplicate the single heal, right? But if you cast a hot on the tank, like reversion on the tank because it takes a lot of damage, then you might want to echo it because then the, the hot is obviously stronger, right? So it's, it's like a decision you have to make with your essences, and I think it's really cool. Then, so, for AoE heals, let's actually um, move all of the heals that we have into a bar. So we can look at all of them. Okay, so the healing spells that we have are Echo. Then Dream Breath. 
This is not a heal. Not really, at least. Reversion is a heal spell. This is technically a heal, but it's like an AoE thing. Then this is a heal. This is a... These two, I'm gonna explain a bit later, but these are not like actually heals. Okay, then we also have uh, Emerald Blossom. And we also have Living Flame. Okay, that's it. I think. There might be some talents I didn't go with yet. Yeah, this would be a heal as well. Let's uh, skill this. Just so we have the spell. Okay. So now we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different healing spells. Which is, let me compare that to other healers. I just want to see uh, how many that is. Like if we compare that to Restodruid, for example. Restodruid has Rejuve, Regrowth. Healing Touch, Eflo, Wild Growth, Swift Mend, Life Bloom. I guess that's it, right? Oh wait, Healing Touch. We don't have Healing Touch anymore? Is that not a thing anymore? Thanks for four months, uh, Gamnon. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Okay, then we only have six healing spells. Unless I missed something. Yeah, true, you could add Nourish. Let's just count Nourish instead then, whatever. I guess you can also cast Scenarian Ward as well. Yeah, so it would be like eight. Um, I don't c count Trank because it's like a cooldown, like a AoE cooldown. But I think we have everything now. So that will be eight healing spells. And Evoker for now has seven. So it's not actually that many. Like it's average, I guess. Okay, yeah, let's quickly talk about um, the cooldowns. So Evoker has an AoE healing cooldown and a single target um, defensive cooldown, just like most other classes have. Like Restodruid has Trank and Ironbark. Um, Paladin has AM and uh, Sacrifice. Disc Priest has uh, Pain Sub and uh, Disc Bubble, right? For example. But yeah, so the cooldowns are Time Dilation and Rewind. Welcome, friend. Um, thank you so much for your sub, Dustin. I appreciate that. Thank you, thank you. So Time Dilation is a one-minute cooldown. Well, actually, reduce the cooldown with a talent. It would be a little bit longer otherwise. So the way it works is that it says stretch time around an ally for the next 8 seconds, causing 50% of damage they would take to instead be dealt over 8 seconds. So this is basically an active um, stagger ability. So if I buff this to myself, I will have a 50% damage reduction, but... It's, it doesn't actually reduce the damage completely, it just makes me take the damage over 8 seconds instead of it happening in instantly, okay? Thank you so much for 58 months, Cole, what's up? So it's basically um, the same thing as a Brewmaster Stagger, but it's like, a, like an, an ability that you cast on another player. And I honestly think it, that's really good. So it's not a true DR, but it technically is. So I think there's many situations where this spell is going to be really good. Because damage that happens over 8 seconds is pretty easy to heal. Damage that happens instantly is not, right? So whenever there's like a lot of damage happening on a player, you can cast this on them and then yeah, you will heal... You have to heal them a lot more for the 8 seconds afterwards, but at least they didn't die, you know? Because a 50% DR is a lot, right? 
So yeah, I like this spell. I think it's really cool. And then their AoE CD is Rewind. And it's a five, four minute cooldown. Uh, it says Rewind 50% of damage taken in the last five seconds by all allies within 40 yards. And then it always heals at least 2.5k. So basically it's a um, it's an alter time for the whole raid without reversing your position. It just reverses your health. Yeah, that's it. That's like the whole explanation. Except it's only 50% of the damage and not 100% of the damage. I personally think this is a pretty bad raid cooldown. If not the worst out of all raid cooldowns. <laughs> no, it doesn't put your health down, it only puts it up. So it just reverses damage taken, basically. Yeah, I personally don't think it's very good just because it's not a damage reduction, it's only a heal. Because it doesn't reduce the damage you're taking, it just heals it away afterwards. So it can be a big heal, but then how important is a very big heal? Like, it's all, yeah, I don't know, like, I just have a, I just don't see how this spell is going to be very good. I think it's very niche as well. Like, I think it can be good. But it needs to have like a very specific situation for it to be good. And it's like... Yeah. It's, 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 hmm. Yeah, I, I don't think it, uh, it works really well. I do think that it's possible that they create raid fights with this in mind. So, because the reason why I think this raid cooldown is not very good is because we never had an ability like this before. Like all the other healers, they don't have a way to fully burst heal the whole raid within a short amount of time. We only really have revival from a monk and that spell is just not very good. So we don't really have a, any healer who can like fully heal the raid or like burst heal the raid really fast. And I think Blizzard keeps that in mind when they design raid bosses, right? Like, clearly, when you design a raid boss, they keep in mind what healers can and cannot do, right? So they're not going to create a raid boss where the whole raid drops to 1% HP, and then two seconds later, they drop again, right? Like, that would be an impossible mechanic to deal with, really. Because there is no healer who can top the whole raid within, like, a second, right? Now, with these healers being implemented and them having this ability, it is possible that they would implement abilities like that into the raid, right? They could say, hey, there's a raid boss where you take a huge damage hit, and then two seconds later you take another huge damage hit. And then, of course, this button would be super good to press in that situation, right? So yeah, it's possible that they changed the way damage profiles work in a raid encounter to make this a good ability. But until now, we didn't really have any situations where something like this would be really good, and therefore I think it's not good. But yeah, they could technically make it good. <laughs> Alright, now these were the cooldowns, and now let's talk about um, the heals. So I already mentioned Echo. Let's divide it into spenders and no spenders, okay? Because some of the casts cost essences and others do not. So Echo costs essences. Then this costs essences. Okay, that's it. And then we have empower spells as well. This is empower, this is empower. Okay. Okay, so you basically have three normal heals, two heals that cost essences, and then two heals that are empower spells, the ones that you need to channel. Uh, so let's look at the normal heals. The easiest heal is Living Flame. This is an offensive or, like this does damage or heals. The 
the thing that I thought is really weird about this spell as a heal is that it has a travel time. So if I want to heal this player here, I cast Living Flame, and it needs to travel to the person before it heals. And I think that is a bit clunky. Whenever heals have travel time, that's just... <laughs> now, to be fair, it is a pretty fast travel time. But it still just doesn't feel great, in my opinion. Thanks for 13 months, guy. What's up? So this also does damage. You can cast it on an enemy or on a, on a friend. It's like penance, basically. Let me see if I can cast this without looking at the person, though. Oh, you can. Okay, good. Yeah, so you don't need to face your target to cast this. Okay, so we have that. Then we have Reversion, which I already talked about. It's a hot. Then has a cooldown. 7.5 second cooldown. And then we have this cooldown here, which is a 1 minute CD, and it's called Dream Flight. And it's basically the same as Deep Breath. So you have this like huge kind of cone, and you like fly over the players and you heal them. It looks really nice. It's a really cool animation. It also applies a buff afterwards. It's kind of like Tranquility, I would say. With an instant heal plus like a hot afterwards. So yeah, these are the spells you can cast without any cost. Then I already talked about Echo. This one costs two essences and it will duplicate any other spell you cast afterwards. Actually, not every healing spell, but only the... Like, it doesn't duplicate Echo. So it, it duplicates everything except Echo. Um, someone was asking if Echo actually duplicates Dream Flight. And I think it might. I'm gonna test that out. Because it says, um, causing your next non-Echo healing spell. But it's not a targeted ability because it says on that ally. So it's possible that it doesn't duplicate. Let's take a look. Yeah, it doesn't look like it duplicated anything. At least the hot didn't duplicate. It's possible, like the instant heal also didn't look like it was duplicated. I guess that makes sense because the spell literally says causing your next non-echo heal spell to cast an additional time on that ally. So I guess it makes sense that it wouldn't duplicate this because you're not targeting any person. Like I think it needs to be a targeted ability for it to duplicate. And this spell is not targeted. Yeah, it does duplicate uh, Emerald Blossom because that one is targeted, right? Yeah, definitely duplicated. So it, it happened twice. Or? Did I make that up now? Let's try it again. It definitely looks like it casted more seedlings, right? I think it does. One more time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It definitely does duplicate. Because um, each time I cast um, Emerald Blossom, it spawns three seedlings. But there were definitely more than three seedlings, so that means there were two, right? Because there were six. Can you try to echo a different target and spirit bloom yourself? Yeah, that works. Like it, I don't, it doesn't matter. Well, actually, that's a good question. Let, let's check it, because the, the wording on it is not that obvious, right? 
Oh yeah, it does work that way. Ah. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So basically the way Echo works is that we'll duplicate onto the person that you cast that Echo on. So if I cast Echo on this priest, and then I cast Bloom on myself, then we'll cast Bloom on... But it didn't. <laughs> now I'm lost. Or maybe it did cast it, just not the, the ground effect? Like maybe it's just the ground effect that didn't get duplicated, but the actual heal did. Yeah. Or And maybe it just doesn't work on Emerald Blossom. But why are there more uh, seedlings spawning than three? Mm -hmm. Maybe there's something like bucked with this, possibly? Because if I, if I cast... Okay, so let me show you this talent. Let me show you why I'm confused. Uh, so I have this talent here. Emerald Blossom, which is the green circle thing. Sends out three flying seedlings when it bursts. Healing allies up to 60 yards away for 30 seconds. Uh, for three. 60 yards? Did they, did they change this? I think yesterday it wasn't 60. Was it? Well, anyway, it doesn't matter. So when I cast... Emerald Blossom, you'll see these three blooms fly out. You see? One went to JB, one went over there, and one went over there, right? I'll do it again to show you. So again, one, two, three, right? But when I use Echo, it casts multiple seeds. Because I cast Echo, and now I cast Bloom. Look. So now I'm confused. Because it definitely does duplicate the seedlings, right? But it doesn't seem to be duplicating the actual Emerald Blossom itself. Which is weird. Especially because I'm casting Echo on another person. I give a cast echo on, on, on this person, then it should be duplicating it on that person, right? But it's duplicating it on me. Hmm. Yeah, I wonder if this is a bit... Like, m maybe not bucked, but like... Probably should work differently, I guess? Is it because an AoE heal and seedlings are single heal? Yeah, that's possible, but... Yeah, like, I can see that... Um, it has something to do with that. But then the seedlings should be spawning out of the echo target, no? Instead of me. I mean, not that it really matters, because it has 60 yards range anyway, so... <laughs> but I think it would make more sense if the seedlings would spawn out of the echo target then. Because all the other spells go on the echo target, so the seedlings should also technically spawn out of the echo target, right? I would think. Hmm. Yeah, exactly. Ian. Yeah, weird. But that's good to know that the seedlings are duplicating, but because that makes it really strong, right? Like, I think that makes echoing Emerald Blossom really strong. I wonder if it has an increased chat. Hmm. 
Hmm, that's a good question. Because I have this talent here. Gain a 30% chance for one of your flattering seedlings to grow into a new emerald blossom. I wonder if all six seedlings count as one or if they count as two. Like, do I have 30% chance for three plus 30% chance of three? Or do I have 30% chance of six of them to spawn one? Probably the latter. Because otherwise it would be too good, I think. But well, we can just try this out and see. One, two. But shit, now someone else was healing and I don't know. <laughs> Fuck, I don't know. I thank you so much for two months, uh, Martel. And thank you so much for the tier two. Appreciate that. Hmm. Yeah, I wonder. Well, let's not go too in depth right now. Let's uh, look at the other spells. Okay, so now we have Dream Breath and Spirit Bloom. So Dream Breath is a uh, empower ability, so you have to channel it. And it says inhale, gathering the power of the dream, releasing to exhale. Healing five injured allies in a 30 yards cone in front of you. And then if you channel it for longer, then it heals slightly more and the cooldown is reduced. So that's like the main thing about this ability is that if you channel it for really long, then the cooldown is much shorter. And it leaves like a hot behind. Wait, I didn't realize it leaves a hot behind. It doesn't say that in the tooltip. Why does it not say that in the tooltip? It says, blah, blah, blah. Release to exhale, healing five injured allies in a 30 yard cone in front of you. It, nowhere does it say that it's a hot. Mm. Weird, I guess. Unless I have a talent, I guess. Yeah. Or maybe this one here. Unless healed by Dream Breath are healed for an additional 30%. Oh, wait, it's like. Ah, okay, okay, okay. I see. So it's not a hot. It's just this talent that makes. that puts a hot additionally. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Yeah, I didn't notice that. Cool. Okay, good to know. <laughs> Thanks for eight months, uh, Karen Pana, what's up? Then we have Spirit Bloom. That one is uh, another Empower spell. And that one says, Divert Spiritual Energy, healing an ally for 7k. Splits to injured allies within 25 yards when empowered. So this heals one person if you empowered it level 1, two people if it level 2, and three people if level 3. Yeah. Okay, that was a crit. I personally don't think this spell is... I mean, I guess it can be good if you echo it. But other than that, it doesn't seem that great. Well, I guess if you echo it, it should be pretty good. Because it's a pretty huge heal. But it's... Even then, it's... Only... Three people? Uh, six people? And it has a cooldown. 30 seconds. Yeah, let's see. So let's cast Echo. Well, actually, does this even work on AoE? Doesn't this just mean that it's going to be four people that heal instead of three? That's what it means, right? Like, if I Echo Spirit Bloom, it will just heal four people instead of three. Because it's only one additional person that gets healed, right? Let me try. So I will echo this person. And then I will... Whisper Bloom level 1. Mm. 
Yeah, I think that's what it means. So it's not actually going to be healing six targets. It just heals one additional target, right? Let's try again, though. So we're going to echo JB. And then we... Oh, that was... Uh... Yeah. I guess I should try it with more than one target, because otherwise it's uh, obviously not going to heal more. <laughs> he had healed too, because one person was echoed and the other person was healed, so that makes sense. Okay, so I'm going to echo this person, and then I'm going to channel it to level 2 and see what happens. So channeling... One, two, three, four. Oh, it healed four. So it does double it. Because it... Yeah. So the way it works is that... It heals a single person. And then it splits from that person to a different person. So that's why it works with Echo. Because then I'm basically duplicating the cast. So I'm healing two people. And then from those two people it splits into other people. Right? So yeah, it does work that way. So it does heal six people. One more time. So I echo this person. And then I channel it all the way. Okay, now I'm not sure if it's split again. I'm not sure now. Wait, what are you saying about two echoes? You can't stack echo, right? Or is it a talent that does, does that? Echo two people? How long does this buff last? I don't think that's how it works, right? I think it doesn't, uh, like, I don't think you can apply it to, like, a million people, you know? I think it will just, like, be one person, no? Yeah, so this person's Echo now. Now I Echo myself. Oh, no, it does! Ooh. Well, you can Echo multiple people. I thought he would only be able to echo one person. The problem with echoing multiple people is obviously they cost two essences, right? But you have a way of making it free with essence burst, right? So technically you could echo a lot of people and have like a huge AoE heal. What happens with breath? So what if I echo JB? And then I have breath over there. Yeah, it echoes the heal plus the breath. But obviously only one time. So the best heal by far to duplicate is Spirit Bloom, right? At the moment. Because you can just echo like three people or four people or something. And then you get like a huge heal. And look, it just bounces around everywhere. Yeah, that seems pretty good. Yeah, even... Even with Emerald Blossom, I think it's really good. Okay, well, let me try that. So what if I echo a bunch of people? Because then you're going to get so many seats jumping around, right? The problem is that Emerald Blossom costs uh, essences as well. Yeah, I could have... How long does it last for it? It 
is pretty long, 14 seconds. But not long enough without any spirit blossoms to like, I would add any essence first. Do we have a devil sack essence first or no? Oh yeah, I do. Okay, let's stack up essence first. And then we're gonna do a huge, okay. So I like, do this, do this, do this. And then we cast this. Yeah, okay. I think the, I think the Emerald Blossom is not as strong to duplicate. Because you don't get increased chance of getting this talent to proc, right? So, even if you have like 9 seeds uh, spawning, you still only have a 30% chance of the blossom to spawn, which is a bit meh, I guess. Yeah, you only really duplicate the seeds, which has a really huge range, though. That's a good thing about the range. So if you, if you have issues with range, I think duplicating Emerald Blossom does make a lot of sense. Because I can stand so far away, and my seeds are gonna, like, jump 60 yards, you know? I can echo JV. Like, look how far they jump. It jumped all the way up to this person. <laughs> no, not each has 30% chance to bloom. It says gain a 30% chance for one of your fluttering seedlings to grow into a new emerald blossom. So it's not each has 30%. You just have a 30% chance for one of them to bloom. So you cannot have multiple of them blooming, it's always just going to be one. And no matter how many seedlings you have, it's always going to be 30%. Yeah, one of your three or one of your six or one of your nine. And I guess that's the problem when you echo it, because you get multiple seedlings, but you don't increase the chance. I think they should actually change that, now that I think about that. I think if you echo... Emerald Blossom... <laughs> I think the chance should be doubled, depending on how many times you echo it. Right? So if you echo it once, it should have a 60% chance. And if you echo it three times, it should have a 90% chance. No, that's wrong, Watcher. No, that's not, that's not true. But what do you mean with um, every proc, proc has it, this chance? And what do you mean by every proc? Yeah, I agree, Boulder, yeah. Every blossom spread out three sprouts? Oh, you're saying if it was echoed? Or what do you mean? Now I'm confused. Oh, you're saying... Oh, we're talking about different things. We're talking about two different things. So, you are saying that... Because obviously, there's three seeds that come out. And then one, a seed could spawn another blossom. And then from that blossom, you can have another three seeds that spawn out. 
And that would have the chance again to spawn a blossom. So technically it could endlessly spawn blossoms. Right? But that's not what I am talking about. I'm talking about echoing the blossom. Because if you echo the blossom, you get six seeds instead of one, uh, instead of three. And if I echo it twice, I get nine seeds instead of three. And as far as I understand, even if you have nine seeds spawning out of one blossom, it still only has a 30% chance to spawn a blossom again. It's not an increased chance just because you have more seeds. And I think that's a bit counterintuitive. I'm basically saying that I think if there are six seeds spawning out of one, then it should have a 60% chance of one of the seeds to spawn a blossom. And if there's nine seeds spawning out of a blossom, then I think it should have a 90% chance of one of the seeds to spawn a blossom. Because otherwise, I think it's not much... Like, otherwise, echoing blossom seems a bit weak. To only proc the seedlings and then not get the talent value. Like, then the talent seems like, eh. No, it couldn't really result in a huge explosion because it's still only one, right? Because even if you get nine seeds, it would only ever spawn one blossom. It would never spawn more than one. It's just an increased chance of it happening, right? Echo with bloom seems much stronger. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just suggesting that they should maybe change, like increase the, the odds of it happening because that would make the talent a bit stronger. I would also make echoing it a bit more like viable, I guess. Anyway, um, yeah, that's like all the heals we have so that we can talk about, really. I think... Yeah, no, I think this, this spec is definitely pretty interesting because it's not very... Um, I think healing with this spec is not very straightforward, in a sense. Because a lot of other classes have heals that are pretty straightforward. It's like you press this, it does AoE heal. You press this, it does single target heal, right? You press this, it does instant heal. But none of the spells um, for Evoker seem that straightforward, right? Yeah, you have Living Flame, which uh, is a pretty straightforward single target heal, right? But all the other spells are not so straightforward. And I think a lot of them are not... Like, you have a lot of heals that are not instant. Which honestly could cause some issues with um, stuff. Very similar to Rasta Druid. Yes, Rasta Druid has a lot of heals, but very few of the heals are, like, instant. And I think the same thing is going to happen with Evoker. I think Evoker is definitely going to be a, um, a healer that has to prepare for damage rather than reacting to damage, right? Because we have reactive healers and we also have healers that need to prepare. And I think this healer is definitely going to be like a preparing healer rather than a reactive healer. Holy Pala, for example, is reactive, I would say. Um, Holy Priest is a reactive healer as well. Um, probably also Shaman. While a healer like like a Disc Priest is needs to prepare for damage. And a Rasta Druid needs to prepare for damage. And Mystery Rider, no, I never played that class. <laughs> and I think this healer evoker is also like a healer that needs to be prepared. So yeah, because you need to get your echoes up, you because you don't really have a heal that like instantly heals people, except your cooldown, right? You have time dilation, which instantly heals people, but it's a four-minute cooldown. I mean, a rewind, not time dilation. And then you also have Dream Flight, which is an instant heal. Um, but it also has a cooldown, right? So one minute cooldown, and you displace yourself. So it's hard to really... Um, like, using this as a reaction, uh, it's probably not that easy, because what if you can't move, right? Like, what if you're standing somewhere and you have to stand in this position? Then you can't just fly across the room. <laughs> Imagine you have blasphemy on you, and you play Anduin. You can't just fly across the room or whatever. 
and like move yourself in a completely different spot, that would be awkward. You can fly a shorter distance as well. Uh, I think the shortest is like 20. I feel like Dream Breath shouldn't be target capped. It is target capped? Oh, you mean Dream Breath. Hmm. Maybe. Well, actually, I think it should be target cap because there aren't really many healers who have AOE heals that are that are not target capped. Like, think about it. Which healer has an AOE heal that heals everyone? That is not a long cooldown. Like, the only heals that heal everyone are, like, raid cooldowns, right? Like, Tranquility heals everyone and, like, Healing Tide or whatever. Yeah, Tranquility isn't kept, but it's an AOE cooldown. It's a three-minute cooldown, right? Flo is target capped, yes. Like, almost all heals are target capped. Like, AOE heals, I mean. So I think it makes sense that this one is too. Because otherwise it might be a bit OP. <laughs> True, but which healer has short range and positioning requirements? I mean, all of healers have position requirements, right? All of healers have to stay in melee range to get to, like, to be able to heal properly. Um, but I also don't think that's how you should be looking at it. Like, whenever you think of balancing, I don't think you should give them a something that is OP because they have something that is a disadvantage to them. Just be like, because when you think about it, yes, they only have 25 yards range and on some of their abilities. But what if there's a boss fight where everyone is sacked up? Then the range is not a disadvantage for you at all, right? The range is not always a disadvantage. Yes, sometimes it will be a disadvantage, but not always. So if you, if you make if you make them really strong because they have a 25 yards range, then it will be too strong in situations where the range doesn't matter, right? And that will cause issues. So I think it should be balanced normally. They should just have ways to heal outside of the 25 yards range, which they have, right? Like, there is a bunch of abilities that they have that um, circumvent their 25 yards radius. For example, uh, like the, the blossoms. Because if I cast a blossom on this person here, then it procs over there all the way. In fact, Evoker technically has the shortest range, but also the longest range out of any healer. Which is interesting. Because <laughs> the actual cast of the spells only has 25 yards, but then from that spell onwards it has 60 yards in the opposite direction. So technically I can heal a person that is 85 yards away from me. And there's no other healer that can do that. So, of course you're limited in the amount of heals you can do on, on that range, but you can do it. So it's like, it's like a, it has pros and cons, right? I think the seeds are just a normal smart heal. I would be surprised if it wasn't. Usually, all of these kind of random heals are smart heals nowadays. So they will just like fly to the most injured players. Yeah, Prayer of Mending works similarly, but. Yeah, I, I guess Prayer of Mending works similarly, yeah. <laughs> Got it.
But yeah, I mean, when you talk about range, I think the only way to really extend the range with anything other than um, Emerald Blossom is using Echo properly, right? Because Blossom obviously can bloom really far away. But then you can also extend your range with, with spells like Spirit Bloom as well, right? Because Spirit Bloom has 25 yards, but if you echo a person, then it has again 25 yards range from that echoed person, as far as I understand. So if I echo this person over here, and then I move all the way over here and heal myself with uh, Spirit Bloom, then it heals the person all the way over there, and then it jumps from there again, you know? So you can definitely like elongate your range by abusing Echo and like being smart about it and stuff. But it's, it's like, it's a hassle for sure. Like it's not, it's not very simple to, to surpass certain range. And you also have to be aware of the position of your, of other players. I think one thing that might be really annoying for um, these green dragons is on how do you display your raid frames. Because the way healers usually look at their raid frames is that if someone is out of range, they let the, the player uh, frame gray out a little, right? So it's slightly, slightly see-through. Um, and what are green dragons are gonna do? Are, gonna, are they gonna put the range to 25 yards? Because they, then they're, they're not gonna see that much. And then they don't really know if someone is low and they have to do a long heal. You know what I mean? Like, I think it might be a bit awkward with their rate frames. But if they don't put it to 25 yards, then they might want to heal a person, then they're not in range. So I think it might be a bit weird for them, honestly. Yeah. yeah, you you definitely really mobile with Hover. Yeah, you can you can... Hover around and heal people while, while moving, which is really, really cool. Yeah, maybe, Ginkgo. Yeah, that might be a good idea. Anyway, guys, I'm going to be right back one second, and then uh, we're going to look at the other class's talents, okay? Because I haven't really looked at any other talents other than Druid and uh, Evoker. So we're going to do that when, I'm when I come back. Be right back.
Eins. Okay, which class should we look at first? Let's do a poll. What classes are out right now? <laughs> Thank you so much for 25, Magic Man. What's up? So, we have... Well, I can actually just check. So it's everything except... Mm, actually, this doesn't even show me what works. Because mage is not implemented, right? Right now, we only have hunter, DK... Evoker, Druid, Shaman, and Rogue, right? Okay, let's do a poll. So we have uh, Shaman, Rogue, Dika. What else? Priest? Hunter. That's it, right? Well, and the others that I already looked at. Thank you so much for gifting us up to Enders. Appreciate that, Stricken. Thank you, thank you. How are you doing, Stricken? Hey, Warzor. Okay, it looks like Shaman is uh, doing really well right now. No one likes DK, it looks like. And no one likes Hunter. <laughs> Thought I had COVID, but the fever broke and it tested negative. All right, well, that's, that's good to hear that he didn't have COVID and that the fever broke. Good, good, good. I hope you feel much better soon. Justice for hunters. <laughs> okay, let's look at Shaman then. What are all the horde races that can be evoker? Only Drakthir. If you want to play evoker, you can only play the dragon. Nothing else. I keep trying to double jump. <laughs> With classes that cannot double jump. Yeah, and he can be alliance or hordes. Alright, let's take a look at shaman. I never actually played shaman, so I'm gonna have a hard time with this class, but we're still gonna look at it. Okay, so how does shaman work? Quick TLDR of this spec. What should we look at? Which spec, actually? Let's look at uh, elemental first. Spellcaster who harms the destructive force of nature and the elements. Resto. Well, we're looking at elemental first. Sorry. Let's look at the base abilities first. It looks like Shaman actually has a lot of base abilities. Okay, this is just rest. Then this is um, teleport or whatever. Then chain lightning is obviously chain lightning. So how does Maelstrom work? Because I actually don't know. It, I mean, I guess it's just a normal generator, right? 
Like you have a hundred maelstrom, it's sim similar to astral power, right? So chain lightning generates, and I guess lightning bolt also generates. Where's sliding bolt? It's baseline. I didn't see it. Oh, it's there. Okay, so this is like single target generator, AOE generator. Then you have a bunch of totems that are baseline, I guess. Slow totem. Far side, then we have flame shock is baseline, I guess. Which is a dot. Basically, moonfire, except it has a cooldown. And you can only apply it to a certain amount of targets. And healing surge baseline, just basically regrowth, heroism, and then lava burst. Oh, it's also a generator, okay, but a cooldown. Hurl smolt and lava, blah, blah, blah. And then it always crits if it's flame shocked, okay. It's inter I didn't know lava burst is a generator. Interesting. And then you have the shield swell. This is just like thorns. This is like a melee attack. And then you have Ghost Wolf. Okay. Okay, so the only spender you have... You don't actually get a spender baseline. You need to skill it. That's interesting. So if you if you don't skill anything, you can't spend your mouse well, Welcome, Tyler Moonkin. Thank you so much for Prime Stuff, Cinderella. Thank you, thank you. Welcome to the land of the magic chicken lady. Okay. Okay, let's take a look at the like shaman trium. So, you have Astral Shift here, which is pretty mandatory, I would say. Chain Heal is not something you get by default. Interesting. So, that's something you want to skill, technically, if you want to. Then Frost Shock is a... I, I guess this side is, like, Elemental. Then... Actually, is it? This looks like the healing side. Then this is, like, a more defensive thing. Maybe this is like elemental enhancement combined on this side. So right is enhancement and this is elemental here where lava bursts is, I guess. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. All right, so frost shock is uh, damage plus slow. The maelstrom weapon, when you deal damage with a melee. Okay, so this is enhancement, right? So this is not something I would use as an elemental. Then casting flame shock reduces the mana cost of your next heal by 10%, increases its healing. Okay, so this is like a hybrid kind of talent. Then we have Hex here. Let's look at the elemental side first. First, So we have increased all fire and frost damage you deal by 3%. What kind of damage does um, elemental shaman do mostly? Because they do a lot of kind they do a lot of damage, right? They have nature damage, frost damage, fire damage. Arcane damage too, I think. Or do you do they not have arcane? Fire, nature, frost. Okay, so no arcane. Okay. Then Earth Elemental is here. Wind shear is here. Then there's Incap Totem. Tremor Totem. Leech and avoidance by 3%, okay. 
Earth shield is here. Elemental orbit. Increase the number of elemental shields you can have active on yourself by one. You can have Earth shield on yourself and one ally at the same time. It is more of a healing thing here. Spirit walker's grace. Okay, then what do we have here? Reduce the cooldown of astral shift by 30 seconds and increase its duration by 6. That's pretty good. Huh, that's really good, I think. A one and a half minute astral shift cooldown that lasts for 14 seconds. That's pretty sick. And then you can even improve it to be a 60% DR. 60% DR is a lot. I don't think any other class has a 60% DR that is not a tank, right? If I... Pain sub is only 50. And then resolve is 40. Um, dispersion is 90. But... Uh, but you can't cast anything during... Dispersion, right? And obviously during Astro Chef you can do whatever you want. Hmm, interesting, yeah. So that's a that can be a really good DR. Then what do we have here? Thunderous pause. Ghost Wolf removes snares and increase your movement speed by an additional twenty five percent for the first three seconds. That's pretty good. But to start into Ghost Wolf we gain five percent increased movement speed and five percent damage reduction every one second second up to four times. Huh. I really like that. Is that something they already have? I think that makes that is uh that is very interesting because you can really like play around this. Like if your astral shift is in cooldown, you can go into Ghost Wolf before damage happens and then get the DR, which is pretty cute. I think I think that I think shamans generally had a little bit of an issue with the uh, DR in general, like damage reduction stuff. So getting stuff like this uh, is, makes a lot of sense for them. Then, um, curse the spell, cap totem. Then when cap totem fades or is destroyed, another cap totem is automatically dropped in the same place. That's more of a PvP thing, I guess. Then this reduces the cooldown of Cap Totem by 5 for each animate stunt. Okay. Yeah, that's pretty good. But not really, like, it's, it's pretty niche, I would say. Then Tremor, and then we have Earth Grub Totem and Wind Rush Totem. Okay. Let's um, use some points so we can keep on going. Then reduce all damage taken by 3%, 6%. Wow, a lot of classes, I feel like, are getting baseline damage reduction now. Almost every class I've seen so far has, like, a basic damage reduction in build. Which... It's kind of funny because it, um... It, like, almost, uh, remo like, makes it irrelevant then? Yeah, exactly. If every class is base DR, then it means nothing, because then everyone... Then the damage will just be adjusted around it, right? So that is uh, a bit interesting. Yeah, the only class that I've... Like, Mo Durit also get base DR, but they get physical DR. No, they actually do get normal DR as well, yeah. Yeah, every class so far I've seen has base DR. Evoker and Druid and Shaman so far. I mean, this is the only three I've seen. <laughs> Maybe it's a hybrid thing. Maybe only hybrids get it. I don't know. Or maybe it's only classes that don't have an immunity. I don't know. Then improved Lightning Bolt. Increase the damage dealt by Lightning Bolt by 20%. So this is like a mandatory elemental talent here. Healing Stream. Then Nature's Guardian. When your health is brought below 35, you instantly heal for 10% of your maximum health. That's okay, I guess. Not that good. 10% heal is kind of a low heal. And 35% is not very low. Whenever there's these kind of automatic heals, the lower the percentage it procs on, the better it is, I think. Um, because 
then it happens less often and you're more likely to die, right? Because if you drop below 35% and it heals you for 10 and then nothing else is happening, then it's whatever. But if you, lo if you drop below 20, then it's much less likely to randomly proc, right? So 35 is a bit high. So I'm not sure how good this is. Then relocates your active totems to the specific location, sure. Purchase the enemy target, removing two beneficial magic effects. Purchase the enemy t removing one beneficial magic effect. Oh, so this is perch, normal perch, and this removes two, but has a 15 second cooldown. I'm not sure if you would ever run Greater Purge. Seems a bit... Like, that seems a bit weird. Like, yeah, you're saving a global, but... I mean, even for PvP, I'm not sure if this is good. Because of the cooldown they incurs. I think in PvP, you'd rather spend more globals and be able to purge all the time, no? At least I would think so. Yeah, I think it... I definitely think there could be situations where it's good, though. Like, it's... Yeah. I can see it being used maybe once in a while. Very rarely, though, probably. Then when Hex ends, the target is slowed by 70%. Reduce the cooldown of Hex by 10 seconds. Okay. Increase the crit strike stance of your nature spells by 2%. Increase the movement speed bonus of Ghost by 5%. When you have 3 or more totems active, your movement speed is increased by 7%. Uh, while reincarnation is off CD, your max health is increased by 10%. While you're at full health, reincarnation cools down 75% faster. Oh. Hmm, that's pretty interesting. I like that, I think. Hmm. Yeah, that's pretty good. I feel like now we're getting to a point where they maybe have too much tankiness right like i know that shamans had issue with survivability but now they're actually getting so much survivability that it it's borderline like op now <laughs> like not to say that i don't think the shaman shouldn't have gotten more but maybe a bit overboard we'll see i guess <laughs> seems a bit much <laughs> Then, I guess the wind hurls you forward. And removes all movement impairing effects, increase your movement speed by 6 7, 8 seconds. Okay. So now they also have like more movement speed stuff. How much forward does it pull you? Oh, goblin jump. Hmm. Yeah, that's pretty nice, I think. Yeah, that's really nice. I like it. That's basically. It's basically Moon can disengage, except it's forwards. But you can obviously aim your character wherever you want, so. Wait, is it an OG CD though? Oh, it's an OG CD. Oh no. I hate it when these kind of movement abilities are an OG CD. It feels so clunky. Ugh. Well, that sucks. Okay, then... Use a healing stream to increase the healing of your... Okay, this is healing again. Nature Swiftness, which is literally the same spell as the uh, Residuta. Then Thunderstorm. Cause then a bolt of lightning dealing nature damage to all enemies within 10 yards, reducing their movement speed of 40% and knocking them away. Oh, this is just a knockback at you. Then lightning less so and thunder shock. Knocks enemies up. I can't really test this now, I guess. Knocks enemies up instead of away. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I kind of know how far up. 
The Enchanted Air Totem summons a totem at your feet for 20 seconds and pre uh, prevents cast pushback and reduces the duration of all incoming. Okay, cool. That's a PvP thing for sure. Then summons a totem at your feet for 15 seconds and reduces physical damage taken a party minus within 30 years by 10%. Did we already have this before? I guess physical, dam physical damage reduction is not as valuable, honestly. Because most spells in raiding do magic damage if they are AoE. Not to say that it's like, like I'm sure it has its usages, right? But if you think about raid bosses, most of the spells are like magic damage because of armor. Because obviously it would be pretty unfair if certain classes take a lot more damage than others from AoE spells. That's why they most of the time it make it magic. Because um, physical damage reduction also happens through armor. And there's obviously class who have more armor than others, and then they just take a lot less damage from stuff. Then we have um, increase the radius of your totems by 70%, increase the duration of your earthbind and earthcraft totem by 5 seconds, of your healing stream. Okay. Uh. Summons a totem at the target location that removes one poison from a nearby enemy or raid members within 30 yards every 1.5 seconds for 6 seconds. Okay, like AoE poison dispel. And what's this? Ancestral Guidance for the next 10 seconds, 25% of damage and healing is covered in now. Okay, this is um, Nature's Vigil, basically. Yeah. The Moonkin set as well. Mana Spring Totem. Okay. Then Surging Shields. Increase the damage dealt by Lightning Shield by 50% and cost an Uh huh. Go with the Flow. Reduce the cooldown of Spirit Walk by 7. 0.5 seconds, reduce the cooldown of gusts of wind by Oh! Wow! Oh no, wait! Huh? This just doesn't work. I guess. Yeah, I guess this is bucked. I guess we report that? I mean, maybe if I put two points in it, but, uh... No, even then it doesn't work. I guess this is bugged. Then, Call of the Elements. Resets the cooldown of your most recent used totem with a base cooldown shorter than three minutes. Three minute cooldown. No, <laughs> this is gonna be so bad for PvP. <laughs> Man, in PvP, someone's gonna be like, Tremor totem, call of the elements. Tremor. <laughs> like you want, you wanted to cast a spell? No, no, no. <laughs> hey, Grand, what's up? How are you? And call of the elements affects an additional totem. <gasps> oh my goodness. Yikes. Yeah, perma grounding. Oof. No, I didn't actually- yeah, I didn't meant Tremor, I meant Grounding, actually, I- I just misspoke. Yeah, I, I was talking about Grounding. It's like, Grounding? And then, uh, Call of the Elements? Grounding. Like, have fun. <laughs> yeah, for DPS it is very useful. I guess there aren't really... There aren't really many DPS talents in this uh, shaman tree here. Like the only thing we have is 
improved lightning bolts. Then this is fire and ice. And then nature swiftness, I guess. And that's kind of it, but I guess that's fine. Like, I don't think you, have, you need like to have a lot of damage talents in their main tree. It's the same with Druid, I think. Druid also doesn't have that many damage um, abilities. Uh, which one did I miss? But anyway, let's look at the actual elemental tree. Again, I don't really play Shaman, so we're gonna have to... <laughs> Try to understand this. Alright. So, Earth Shock. Instantly shocks the target with the uh, Confessed Force. Cost. Is this like. Is Earth Shock like your main thing that you spend your Maelstrom on? Like your main spender? But it's single target, right? So, your main single target spender? Okay. Then, with Earthquake, this is your main AoE spender. Cast the Earth with an ADR as the target location to tremble. There's over six seconds, has to turn up. Yeah. Then we have Elemental Fury. Your damage, damaging critical strike deal 250% damage instead of the usual 200%. Okay. Then we have Fire Elemental. Then Ancestral Wolf Affinity. Cleanse Spirit, Wind Shear, Purge, and Totem Cast no longer cancel Ghost Wolf. Ah. Oh. That's a PvP thing, though, I think. I don't think you want this for PvE. Like, it's not really that useful, I don't think. Then your healing critical strike, um, okay. and this is also this is a healing thing. Master of the Elements, casting Lava Burst increases the damage or healing of your next nature, physical or frost spell. Let this understand. Huh. Okay, I think it's a bit, well, I don't want to say it's bad necessarily, but like you... The fact that you have to take like a utility thing here that is not necessarily useful to you um, feels a bit bad to get to this, right? Yeah, because I don't think this is necessarily like a must, right? This is like utility that is pretty optional. So the fact that you have to take this to get to Master of the Elements and Swelling Maelstrom is a bit... It's fine, right? But yeah. Then uh, you successful purge, clan spirit, healing stream, blah blah blah. Generate a maelstrom during combat, and then increase the chance for earthquake to knock enemies down by fifty percent. Okay, so this is another utility thing. I guess this is also utility then. Okay, so it looks like all three notes here are utility. Hmm. I mean, do, hmm. I'm not sure I like that. You like that? Like, especially if you want to have multiple. Like, what if I want Call of Thunder, Master of Elements, and Lava Surge? Then I need to commit three utility points to get to it. It's a bit... Yeah, I don't know. I personally am not the biggest fan of that, I think. Because I like having utility, um, but I usually prefer utility being a little bit off to the side. So that you can take the utility if you want to, and otherwise you just go forward. If you're going to put utility on the spec at all, that's the best way to do it. I mean, I disagree, though. Because you could literally say... Like, you could make... Let's say Earthquake leads into Call of Thunder, and then this node could be off to the side. Right? So you have an option to take it, or you just don't. And the same for this middle part and this part. I mean, I'm, I don't think it's like horrible, but I do think there would be an option to give you utility without it being a mandatory thing, right?
Especially because you're forced. Well, anyway. Let's just move on and see what else that we have here. So, Swelling Maelstrom. Let's see, where's, um... Is there, like, a clear path between AoE and single target? AoE's left. Except storm elements. Okay, interesting. Okay, so let's say we have to go over here for let's like do an AoE spec. Okay. So first we have you flame check damage over time, has a ten percent chance to reset the remaining cooldown of lava burst and cause your next lava burst to be instant, okay? Then we have Color Fire, increase the damage of your Flame Shock, Lava Burst, Lava Beam, and Fire Elemental by 10%. And then improved Flame Tongue, imbuing your weapon with Flame Tongue, increase your Fire Spell damage by 5%. And then we have Storm Elemental. Yeah, that is interesting that Storm Elemental is here, I guess. Because you have all of these, like, fire kind of single target spells. And then Storm Elemental, which is both single target and AoE, right? Interesting. Okay. Then, um, increase the damage of your lightning bolt, chain lightning, and storm elemental by 15%. Oh! So the storm elemental buff is up here, but the actual elemental is down here. <laughs> huh, interesting, okay. Then, lightning bolt generates two additional maelstrom. Uh, storm keeper. Cast light, lightning bolt and chain lightning reach the cooldown of your nature spells for one second. Wait, uh. I'm not getting this. Oh, reduces the cooldown. Oh, I'm just stupid. So it's not cast time. Oh, I, for some reason I thought cast time. And I was like, how does it just stack up infinitely? Or ah, it's just cooldown. Okay, I'm just stupid. Okay. Then as a story, it reduces the maelstrom cost of earth shock and earthquake by five percent. Okay. Uh, by ten, not percent. Ice fury. Holds um, frigid eyes at the target, dealing frost damage and causing your next frost shocks to deal increased damage and generate a maelstrom. Okay. Then, Ice Fairy causes your frost shocks to damage up to four additional enemies. Oh. Take 50% increased damage from your nature spells for four seconds. Strain lightning first starts with this effect. Hmm. Passing frost shock increases the damage of your next lava burst by 10%. So this is AoE sing versus single target? Huh. Frost Strikes are PvP, but is it though? This... I mean, wouldn't this be good on AoE as well? Like, PvP? PV? I think this seems really good. It's not better than what you normally take? Well, what would you normally use? Okay, I have a question. So what do we... On live servers, what does a elemental shaman do on AoE? Like, do you just cast... Uh, flame shocks into like chain lightning, into spending it on uh, earthquake, and that's it. Yeah, well then, well then this would be clearly better, no? 
because you you weave it in right because if you go with this what you would do is you you frost shock then you chain lightning then you frost shock chain lightning you know like you used to the damage increase right and it gives you maelstrom as well so you generate maelstrom quicker to be able to cast um um earthquake much more often what is eq what is the abbreviation eq stand for oh earthquake no it wouldn't replace earthquake right you would still use your maelstrom on earthquake Right? You're like you that's your only AoE spender, right? So obviously you also use that to get rid of your maelstrom. You would just um you would just weave in earth shocks in between. Uh frost shocks. Yeah, so what you would basically do is like you go you get to a pack, there's like ten targets or whatever. Okay, maybe not ten, let's say six. There's you six targets, you ice fury, then you frost shock. Wait, how long does this last? Let's use this. I just wanna see how long this lasts. Oh, it's a pretty short duration. But I, I still think you can weave in a bunch of stuff, right? And you just do this, and then this, and then this again. Right? You just weave it. So it's just like frost struck chain lighting, frost struck chain lighting. And then depending on how long the buff is left, you can even cast more than a few. Yeah, that seems really cool though, I like it. That's a cool rotation, no? Okay, let me bind this properly so I can do it. Yeah, so you do- wait, I mean, obviously with, uh, Flame Shock? Oh no, I probably wouldn't have Flame Shock. Anyway, so I do this. You don't even have to weave multiple, you just weave one. Yeah. Yeah, that seems cool. I like it. Then, Airshock and Earthquake have 10% chance to refund all mouse from spend. Aw, oh, shit! Man, I'm so jealous! I wish this would be how Moonkin plays. This seems so much fun! Oh, man! Oh, you actually get to press buttons on AoE? Why can't Moonkin press buttons on AoE? <laughs> this seems so much fun! You can, you actually have generators, you can spend your maelstrom and stuff. You know? Kind of cool. <laughs> like this. Then, casting Lava Burst of 5% chance to cause your next two lightning bolts or chain lightning to trigger Elemental Overlord an additional time. What is Elemental Overlord again? Oh, it's mass. Oh, shit. I didn't read the mastery. Your lightning build, ice fury, lava burst, chain lightning, cast have a 35% chance to trigger a second cast on the same target, dealing 65% of normal damage and generating acid. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. It's nice. And then what is this? Okay, I'm not sure I understand this now. Okay, wait. So if I cast a Lava Burst, and I get the proc, what does it mean that it has a chance to trigger it 
an additional time. Does, it, does that just mean it, took, it takes a percentage and then applies it twice? Or what? Oh, two lighting bolts have a... Does lighting bolt have like a 100% chance to proc it or something? That's a lot of ifs. Like, what if I cast a lightning bolt and elemental overload doesn't proc? Then it just does nothing? And if it does proc, it procs twice? I can't, that's, I don't sound like that. That's a lot of energy. <laughs> Huh, this is a bit weird. I'm not a fan of that. <laughs> That's a bit too much RNG for my taste. An elemental casino, yeah. <laughs> huh, yeah, interesting. Hmm. Then, Lava Burst is an additional charge. Then, Flame Shock damage over time effect night cursors and more frequently. Reduces the cooldown of Flame Shock by 1.5%. Cool. The thing with Flame Shock, you don't actually apply Flame Shock on multiple targets when it's like, like, and plus when things die too quickly, right? Or maybe only once? Yeah, right? You don't like you don't run around applying flame shocks on AoE, right? It's more for funnel, okay that makes sense. Yeah, so this this side you would more go for like single target or like funnel stuff, I guess. Or maybe like a I really like this because I think um there's multiple different ways on where you can use the flame shock build, right? Because it's not just single target. It's probably also really good on like a lower amount of target cleave. Like if you if you fight two targets or three targets that live for a long time, then you probably also go with this, right? Like that's makes sense. So I think you have a lot of like really cool niches that you can spec into so far at what I've seen. Like you can spec into more heavy AoE, but you can also go into more like lower amount of target cleave and then you can also go like single target so it seems kind of fun so far the trio looks cool except the utility up here which is uh, which is forced on you but it is what it is then liquid magma totem and primal elementalist summons a totem at the target location that erupts i honestly wouldn't hate playing shaman if only i wouldn't hate totems so much i hate totems you're just so clunky and annoying. Like the, the like the class itself seems fun, you know, elemental. Like their spells seem fun and everything, but like totems, like ugh. Hey totems. Anyway, what does this one do? Uh okay, the rough stealing, fire damage, and applying flame shock on three enemies within nine yards. Because he was hurling liquid moment, blah blah blah, every now, blah blah blah. Sure. I mean that seems like an AoE totem. That seems like it might be okay, right? Or not? I mean, yeah, it's a one minute CD, but it's better than nothing, I guess. Then, primal elementalists, your earth, fire, and storm elementals are drawn from primal elements, 80% more powerful than regular elementals. Additional abilities, and you gain direct control over them. Okay, yeah. Then, let's look at this. Mental Blast replaces Earth Shock. It costs 75 Maelstrom and is a cast. Harnesses the raw power of the ele elements, dealing 5k elemental damage and increasing your critical strike or haste by 3% or mastery by 6%. That's just RNG here? All right, I guess. <laughs> Amazing. 
I mean, it's kind of funny because this is like, this is definitely like a single target thing, right? Like this is, this is definitely single target. It costs 75 Maelstrom, just a single target damage. So you don't really want to use this on the area. Then what do we have here? When you cast Earthshock, gain Lava Surge and increase the damage of your next Lava Burst by 20%. What's Lava Burst again? It's this one, right? Yeah. Okay, so this is also single target. Then, Echoes of Great Sundering. After casting Earthshock, your next Earthquake deals 6% additional damage. Hmm. I mean, that's pretty good. Your, your, your... Dude, Earthquake is gonna do so much damage if you combine it with, um... With Ice Fury and this, right? How long does the buff last? Let me see. That's wrong, Shock. Where's Earth Shock? Oh, it costs Maelstrom, true. Ah, but it costs Maelstrom. Am I gonna spend that much Maelstrom to cast an Earthquake? Probably not. On Aoe. You are? I mean, I guess it's just 120% additional damage, so... So you basically do 20% more damage in that case. Right? Because basically, instead of casting an Earthquake, you cast an Earth... So you could either cast two Earthquakes, or you cast one Earthshock and one Earthquake. So it's a 20% damage increase. In, like, it says 1 in 20, but you give up one Earthquake for it, so it's 20, right? Yeah, 20 plus the Earthshock, but the Earthshock is single target, so... It's whatever, I guess. <laughs> plus the Talented Refense Maelstrom. Um, wait, which one was that again? Middle... Yeah, but that doesn't really matter because it applies to both Earthshock and Earthquake. So in that like that actually doesn't matter for, for that at all. Right. You can have multiple earthquakes up at the same time, right? Yeah, okay. Things additional one twenty percent after Earth Shock. Yes. Wait. Like I am making sense, right? Like the 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 earthquake that you cast does the damage of two earthquakes. Plus 20% of an earthquake. But you're giving up one earthquake for it. So you're basically not gaining 120%, you're technically gaining 20% plus an earth shock, right? Yes, okay. Okay, okay, okay. We're good, we're good, we're good. Okay, um. Oh, your Stormkeeper, Storm Elemental. Oh no, this was... Oh no, this affects Storm Elemental, not Stormkeeper, okay. Then what is this in the middle? 
Oh, we already read this. So this is like a single target thing here in the middle. Then we have Stormkeeper. Touch yourself with lightning. It costs you your next two lightning bolts to deal 150% more damage. And also costs your next two lightning bolts or chain lightning to be instant cast and trigger an elemental overload on every target. Last thing is really good. And then lightning rot, your earth shock and earthquake cast have one percent chance to make your targets a lightning rot for eight seconds. Huh? Lightning rot take thirty percent of all damage you deal with lightning bolt and chain on. All damage you deal. Lightning rots take twenty percent. I'm not sure I understand this. I like understand it for Earth Shock, but I don't understand it for earth Earthquake because Earthquake is a ground targeted ability, right? So how does it work? Does it apply to all targets that you hit with Earthquake or does it apply to your target? Or it's whatever you're targeting. Ah, that's a bit funky. Sometimes that's a bit weird. Because we have the same thing right now uh, on live servers with two bit, two set bonus for Moonkins. And sometimes it like breaks the sea and if you don't have a target, it does something weird. It's like, it can be a bit awkward. Also, does it have infinite range? Wait, I want to test this. Cause this can be really bad if it doesn't work perfectly. Okay, how do we test this? Uh, uh, the problem is there isn't... Like the, the dummies aren't that far apart here. I guess we can test it with uh, this back one and then move all the way over there. Okay, let's see. So let me read this again. Uh, where's this spell? Okay, so Earthshock um, casts up a one to make your carry lightning rod for 8 seconds. Lightning rods take another damage damage you deal with lightning bolts and chain lightning. Okay, so if I give this guy an Earthshock... Okay, wait, where's my spell here? Where's my lot? Where's my this one here? Okay, wait, I need to, I need to get some Maelstrom. Is there like a really fast Maelstrom generator or something that I can press real quick? Okay, we can we can cast it now. Oh, and it's not even a spell. I'm stupid. Okay, so we cast Earth Shock here. So this guy is now a lightning rod. So now if I cast Chain Lightning over here, wait, which one was it? Fuck, I forgot which one I casted it on. Shit, <laughs> we have to do it again. Let's cast in this one because I can see this one better. Oh, it does work. What if I target it? Ooh, okay, wait, 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 wait. So what if I... Where's Earthquake? What if I target this mob, but I put my Earthquake here? It didn't work. Oh, this guy turned into a lightning rod. So I guess if it's too far, it will be the closest target. Okay, let's go max range. Okay, so now I'm targeting this guy. I put Earthquake here. It still didn't put it on my target. I don't think it's your target. 
I don't think it's your target. Unless the target has to be inside the earthquake. Let's try that. Okay, so if we target this guy... Oh yeah, now it worked. Okay, so I guess it's your target inside the earthquake. And if you're not targeting anything inside the earthquake, then it's probably just like a random target within the earthquake. Let's see if there's a logic to it. Like maybe it's like the closest or something. I'm not gonna target anything now. Yeah, I think it's closest to the player. If you don't target anything. Okay, that makes sense, I guess. Okay. So it's not as fancy as I thought it is. It's bad for AoE. Well... It's not that bad for AoE, I guess. I mean, it's kind of bad. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely not... It's not great. Alright, done. Dealing direct fire, frost, nature damage within 10 seconds uh, will increase all damage dealt by 70% Wait, what? Dealing direct fire, frost, and nature damage within 10 seconds? What does that sentence mean? It'll increase all damage dealt by 70% for 10 seconds. Oh, all of it. Ah, I get it. Ah, I see you. So you have to cast a fire, a frost, and a nature spell. Okay, I get it, I get it. <coughs> okay. That's interesting, I guess. Hmm. <clears throat> nah, never mind. I mean, I guess. You could technically practice on AoE, right? Because Ice ice Fury is um, frost damage. Then Earth Shock is um, nature damage. Then you just need a fire spell, right? And that would just be like Flame Shock. Bad waste of points. I mean, is it? think it's that bad yeah because on AoE you can cast like you cast flame shock ice flurry and then you earth shock obviously you don't have enough mana now or maelstrom but then you would proc it right and then you just cast um and then you just spam lightning chain lightning plus earthquake like, I think that would be pretty good. Seven percent for 10 seconds. Uh, it's more than that, right? Because it has multiple points? Oh no, it does. It has, it has two points. So it, it's... Uh, it's a 15% damage increase for 10 seconds. I mean, 15% is a lot. Okay, so, wait. Let me show you. Okay, so you would do this, yeah? So you... Flame shot? Oh no, wait, I got rid of the talent now. Fuck! We need this talent. <laughs> okay. So. Flame shock. Ice flurry. This. And then earthquake. And then frost shock. And this. Okay, I definitely casted a thing too early though. I'll get a proc. Hmm. I don't know, I think this would be good. It's only 10 seconds though. Also, I forgot to cast Lava Burst. I should have cast that too. I don't know. I think it's like a lot of burst damage. <laughs> it procs with a talent that replaces Earthshock though? Wait, what? 
wants to tell him that Welcome I play Zora Shark again? Welcome to the Nakura again? show. Uh, thank you so much. I guess the answer to do uh, to only NGF. Thank you so much, Dooners. What's up? How are you? Happy Friday. Oh, Elemental Blast. Uh, where was that again? Oh, here. Oh, wait. So just pro. Yeah, but this is not good for AoE. You wouldn't cast this on AoE. Nah. Nah, 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 this wouldn't be good. Well, not for AoE, for single target, maybe. <clears throat> now, it costs too much. And if you play Ice Fury, then the only spell school that you're missing to practice is Fire. Because you cast Frost and Earth anyway. So it wouldn't be worth it to, to use this just to proc Fire, right? Then he would just cast a uh, lava burst, a uh, flame shock. I think. Yeah, no, I think this 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 is. Uh, I don't think this is as bad. I think it's kind of good. Oh, I forgot to skill this, so it didn't even work properly the way I wanted to. Because I'm stupid. Wait, let's kill everything we want, and then we do the number thing. See what happens. I really want to make this work, guys. <laughs> this has to work. Okay, we're doing it. Okay, just wait, just wait. I'm gonna show you. We're trying to make this work. This ice flurry plus, uh, plus uh, elemental equilibrium. We just need to have some, uh, some Maelstrom first. Okay, I think I should do it differently too. I think I should cast this first, let me think. I think we Earthshock first, no, I think we, we, uh, Flame Shock into Earthshock into Ice Fury. Yes. Yes. So we do Flame Shock, this. Then we cast this, then we cast this, to this, into that, into this. Oh my god, I have so many procs! <laughs> okay, what is this proc? What does it do? Lava burst. Yeah, whatever, I guess. Perfect! Wait, did this not proc earlier? Wait, it's only one? No, 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 never mind. Okay, it did work. It's a different one. <laughs> yeah. For a second, I was like, it's one spell? <laughs> okay, okay, I got it now. Hey, kiddo, what's up? <laughs> I still believe this is good. Like, I don't understand why you guys think it's so bad. Like, I, you honestly have to explain this to me. Everyone just says it's bad. It is good. Thank you, Kena. Thank you. Right? Like, if you combine it with Ice Fury. And then Echoes of Great Sundering and stuff. Like, it's good, right? Yeah, I know that it procs with elemental damage, but... I was thinking if you play Ice Fury that you don't need to do elemental damage. Because <laughs> Ice Fury is Frost, and then you would cast Earthshock anyway, and then you only miss fire damage, right? Which would just be Flame Shock. I mean, it would be more of a burst damage build, because obviously you only have it up for a short time. But if mobs die pretty fast, then... I guess. Anyway, let's see what else we have. 
<laughs> Thanks for two months, Bernie. What's up? Okay, so then we have from earlier wave. Blast the target with primarily a wave, dealing elemental damage and apply flame shock so to an enemy. Or heal an ally for 700, okay? What does that mean, or? Like, what the fuck? Like, it either applies a dot or it heals someone? And it's random? Or what? What is this class, dude? Is it target? But it doesn't say it heals. Like it says, blast your target with primordial wave dealing damage. It doesn't say it deals damage or heals. Does the spell heal? I get it now. Okay, so it's if you cast an enemy, it does damage plus applies flame shock, or you heal an ally for seven fifty six, and then flame shock does nothing. Uh, okay, I got it. But I was so confused. I thought you're, <laughs> I thought you're doing damage to your target, and then it either applies flame shock to your target, or it heals a friendly player. <laughs> and I was just like, what? <laughs> How does that make sense? <laughs> All right, then from holding away for some reason that's uh, not in cured skill that okay, cool. Then splintered elements each additional lava burst generated by from holding wave increases your haste by six percent for twelve seconds. I don't get it. <laughs> oh, okay, I see him. So, all additional targets that he hit with lava bursts get hit by. Or give you haste. Ah, uh, I see, okay. So if you have five five flame shocks up, and you cast a lava burst and a non flame shock target, then you get. How far does the stack? Forever. Endlessly. Oh, you can only have five up at the same time, I guess. Six, actually. Okay, that makes sense, I guess. Apparently the cap is six. Okay, now, what else? Uh, echo chamber. Increases the damage dealt by your elemental overloads by 7%. What's elemental overload? Oh. Oh, the mastery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, the mastery is way too RNG. I'm not a fan. I wouldn't take a single talent that buffs my mastery. Fuck that. I'm not playing RNG Fiesta. If I, if I want to gamble, I go into a fucking casino, okay? <laughs> anyway. Ascendance. Transfer into a flame ascendant for 50 seconds, replacing chain lightning with lava beam. Removing the cooldown on lava burst and increasing the damage of lava burst by an amount of equal to your cooldown. Uh, when you transform into a flame ascendant, instantly cast a lava burst to a double lime in the flame and a refresh your flame. Okay, this sounds too complicated. 
We're not taking this. <laughs> Casting level versus seven percent chance to activate a status for six seconds. Ah shit! Another one. Ascendance <laughs> active gains seven percent. Oh fuck! Casting Earthshock or Earthquake while Ascendance is active extends the ratio of a shit. Man, do you actually have to use Ascendance? Oh, it's too complicated. I don't like it. <laughs> I'm not taking this talent. Fuck it. Then Earthshock and Earthquake and trigger your mastery element to overlap future with effect. No! I said no mastery. <laughs> okay, then what else? Reduce the cooldown of Flame Shock by. Uh huh. We have a red disc, and then flame check damage has 100% chance to generate one maelstrom. Okay. Then skybreaker sphere demise. Flame shock damage over time. Crit strike reduces the cooldown of fire elemental by one second. And flame shock has a vision and has increased. Okay, I'm sure. Storm elemental, and then we have magma chamber. Flame shock and damage increase the damage of your next earth shock elemental blast or earthquake by 0.5 seconds up to 20 times. Okay. So what would you take on AoE? I'm still a big fan of this build here. Ice Fury. Ice Fury for the win. Stormkeeper. Oh, where's Stormkeeper? Well, yeah, you can have Stormkeeper and all of this. Right? Uh, Ice Fury is really strong right now. I knew it. Thanks, Kena. I said that earlier and people were like, nah. Okay, some people said it was good, but there were also some people who said it sucks. <laughs> A lot of people said it's good, though. <laughs> anyway, I like this. I like this a lot. Man, Elemental Shaman uh, is going to be so much fun. So much more fun than Moonkin is. Oh my god, I need to re-roll! And so tanky! They seem so tanky. So tanky and so much damage. Well, I don't know how much damage they're gonna do, but... At least they're gonna... Have a lot of buttons to press. That could technically do damage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this shaman soon shun. Maybe we play shaman now. Anyway, let's look at the uh, resto as well. People said resto is fun. Okay, riptide. Then healing rain, healing wave, healing stream totem. Healing wave, healing surge, and chain heal. Heal for an additional 10% on targets affected by your healing rain or riptide. Okay. Tidal waves, casting riptide grants two stacks of tidal waves. Tidal waves reduce the cast time of your next healing wave or chain heal by 20%, or the crit effect chance of your next healing surge by 30%. Okay. I like it. Overflowing Shores. Healing Rain instantly restores one health to six allies within its area and its radius increased by one. Healing Rain instantly restores. Hmm. So, like an instant heal. Hmm. That seems cool. Hmm. Then, Flash Flood. When you consume Tidal Wave, the cast time of your next heal is reduced by 10%. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you get a cast time reduction on a heal, and when you consume that cast time reduction, you get another cast time reduction? It's interesting, I guess. A bit weird. Because they could just say Tidal Wave has two stacks or something. Right? Or am I missing something? Later, Jack. Have a good one.
Hmm. Anyway, uh, lava surge. Your flame shock damage over time. Okay, sure. Then spirit link. Water totem mastery. Consuming. Wait, what is uh? Increase healing from your spells, but up to oh, based on the current health of your target. Four health targets are healed for more. Okay. Consuming tidal waves reduces the cooldown of healing stream, healing tide, mana spring, mana tide, by two. What the fuck? Oh, it reduces the cooldown. Okay, never mind. Not cast time. Yeah, this this flash flood is a bit interesting. Like, like not to say it's bad or anything. It's just like really weird. Like it's just really awkward. I think. Cause the, it's a bit weird. Oh, I'll check. Okay, then, what else do we have? Um, Master of Elements cast Lava Burst, increase the damage or healing of your next nature, physical or frost spell by 10%. Mm -hmm. Refreshing water, so healing Hello, surge is more effective Welcome. than yourself. Okay. Uh, thanks for Prime stuff. Uh, the Shui, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Then Clappers and Living Stream. Well, the Clappers is the thing, right? Collects power from all of your healing spells when the totem expires or dies, the server is released. Then living stream, healing stream, totem seal, seven more so, okay. Then increase the initial heal from rift type at 10%, cool. Earth living weapon, imbue the shaman's weapon with earth and life, which gives you a rift type healing wave. Which gives you a rift type healing wave, healing search, and continue. Trigger earth living on a target healing initial. Okay, like an extra hot, I guess. Then, Anctotem. Earthwall. Mana Tide. Healing Tide. Wait, what? I haven't seen Mana Tide in a long time, right? Shamans didn't ha they they didn't have this for a while, right? The last time I remember Mana Tide was uh... You have it now. Is it like really bad? Why well, didn't ever hear anyone say I'm putting Mana Tide? Oh, it's just really bad right now? Oh okay. That explains it I guess. No, I'm thinking of Mana Tide. Like in the past, I remember it was really good. And then Shaman had like a yell macro. I have a replacing mana tide right now. And then the mana, uh, the healer said to go to the mana tide to actually get the mana, right? It was really good back then. But I guess it doesn't matter. Then healing tide. Riptide and Lava Burst have an additional charge. Okay. Then, what else have we here? Deal nature damage every one second to up to six enemies out of your healing line. What? Acid Rain? That's broken! They have an AoE damage spell. OP. Or chain lighting damage increase by 35%. Huh, actually, I would go with acid rain. I like that. Then, clan spirit, windshear, perch, and totem cast on long cat. Cancel ghost wolf. PvP thing, I guess. 
Stormkeeper, charge yourself with lightning, casting an next two lightning. Yeah. Yes. Vigor. Then Flood of Tides. Casting Chain Heal on a target affected by Riptide consumes Riptide. Increasing the healing of the Chain Heal. Sure, I guess. Increasing the healing of Chain Heal by 8% and cost it to bounce an initial time. Sure. Then Unleash Life. Undulation. Every third healing wave. Hmm. Then. Unleash Elemental Force of Life, healing a friendly target for 2k and increasing the effect of your next healing spell. Riptide Healing Wave or Healing... This is Soul of the Forest! Riptide Healing Wave or Healing Surge, 30% 35% increased healing. Chain Heal, increased healing and bounce to one extra target. Healing Rain or the two additional allies healed. Wellspring to... Yeah, this is literally uh, Soul of the Forest from Forest of Druids. I like that. Gives you options. I always, I always liked Soul of the Forest. I thought it was a cool idea to have something that buffs a spell, but you have to choose which one you want to buff. I always think that's that's a cool idea for healers. Then, last year, I never liked the fact that you proc it with Swiftman, though, for Druids. Because Swiftman is like an emergency instant heal. And I swear to God, the amount of spells and things that Blizzard always ties to Swiftman has always annoyed me so much. Like they they did this all the time. Where it's like, oh, if we swift if you Swiftman, then something happens. And I always hated that. Because it feels like you're wasting your Swiftman. And it's one of your only like instant heals. You kinda wanna hold on to your Swiftman in case someone drops low and you have to heal them quick, right? So it always sucks that you have to use your Swiftman to buff another spell. I always hated that kind of correlation. So I like the fact that they have Soul of the Forest, but it's its own heal. Like, you don't have to waste another spell to proc this. Like, this is a much better version of Soul of the Forest, I think. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, moving on from earlier wave. Last year target with primordial wave dealing. Wait, what? Oh, it's the same thing as uh, elemental has. Your wave will also hit all targets affected by your riptide. Mm. Okay, how many riptides can you have up? Infinite. Well, I had a six seconds cooldown, so I guess. You can only have uh, as many as you can fit. <laughs> Done. Okay. From only a wave, I and cure its cooldown. Oh. Oh, that's too RNG, though. 15%. Oof, I don't like that. That's too low. Nyeh. Reduce the cooldown from early wave by 15 seconds. Yeah, that is much better. Yeah, this is uh, <laughs> this is messed up. <laughs> Whoever plays this talent is definitely a gambler. Then downpour, a burst of water, uh, a burst of water at the target's location heals up to six injured allies within 12 yards. Cooldown increased by five seconds for each target effectively healed. Oh, cooldown increased by five seconds for each. Huh. Interesting. Okay. I like this. I mean, this this is pretty good. Well, it seems good. I don't know if it's actually good, but depends on the numbers, I guess. <laughs> then, Ancestral Awakening. Did I already read this? Yes. When you critically heal with your healing wave, search or riptide, summon an Ancestral Spirit to aid you, instantly healing the lowest percentage health friendly party or rate target with 40 yards with 10% of the amount of healed. 10% of the amount healed. Hmm. I mean, that doesn't seem bad. Also, how much percent is it? 20%. I don't think that's bad. 
That seems pretty good. Depends on how much crit you have, obviously, right? If you crit a lot, then this is probably good. Hmm. Yeah. Then high tide. Every 20k mana you spend brings a high tide, making your next two chain heals for an additional... Wait, what? Heal for an additional 10% and not reduce with each jump. 20k? That's a lot. Don't they only have 50k? Hmm. I don't like this. I don't think I like this. Especially because it's pretty... Like, it's pretty random-ish. Like, it, it might proc more than I think, but it's like... It's really hard to control it, I think. Because you can track it with a weaker, probably, where... We say, you know, like you track how much mana you've spent. But let's say you're really close to proccing it. But you don't want to have it proccing now. Then what do you do? Just not like sit there and not do anything? You know what I mean? Like isn't that awkward then? Because damage spells also cost mana. So you can't even sit there casting damage spells. Like then you just sit there and do nothing. Well, it depends how, how long the buff lasts, I guess. Let's see how long the buff lasts. What's my highest mana cost spell? Okay, last 30 seconds, so it's, uh, it's a decent amount, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't hate it, but I don't think it's, it's great. Then Primal Tides. Every four cast of Riptide also applies Riptide to another friendly target near your Riptide target. That seems much better. <laughs> that seems really good. Especially with Primordial Wave, right? Oh, every four casts of Riptide. But still. Yeah, man. I think it's pretty good. Then, Nature's Focus. The primary target of your chain heal is healed for an additional 20%. Okay. Yeah. Then, Earth and Harmony. Earth shield healing is increased by 50%. If your earth shield target is below 75% health, healing wave and healing surge add a stack of earth shield to your target up to 9. Okay. Then we have ascendance here. Undercurrent. For each riptide active on an ally, your heals are. Oh. I like the hot play style, I think. I like playing Primal Tide Core and then just like do all of the Riptide talents. That seems fun. Overcharging mana for 8 seconds, increasing your haste by 10% and healing for them by 10%. Well, overcharging your mana regenerates is, is haltered. Ah, seems good, but also like. Bit dangerous. Because you can run pretty quickly with this. 
Then wellspring. Creates a surge of water that flows forward, healing for Nectaris in a wide arc. Hmm, okay. Oh. Okay. That is a pretty wide arc. Hm. I like this, kinda cool. It's cute. Precious shaman mana management is everything. You can heal forever if you don't waste mana. Well, yeah, but if, like if you run this, um, if you run with this talent, then obviously you also want to use it. And if you use it, you would be running really low on mana, right? Like, it, I, I think this talent has its usages probably, but uh, we probably have to use it on fights that are shorter or in stuff like in plus as well. Because in Mythic Plus, mana is not that important because you can drink so often um, in between stuff. So, yeah. But I wouldn't I wouldn't play this talent probably on a 10-minute fight that I'm progressing on, right? Like, at that point, you're probably going to be oom. Um. Rest of Shaman damage is going to be very good in 9.10.0, but maybe that will be okay in the new 9.0 then. Oh, isn't going to be very good in 10.0. You think your damage is not going to be that good? Why? I mean, you have the spells for the damage. Like, you, you always have to think about it this way. We are in alpha right now, so there's zero balancing that is being done, like, number-wise. There aren't any numbers that are being balanced right now. That's not their focus. But if you look at your talents, you have spells to do damage. And that's the only thing you can look at right now. Because the numbers are irrelevant. And I can see spells that are good for M+. They just need to be buffed. They just need to have good numbers, right? You have Acid Rain. That's an AoE damage spell. That is already, like, very good because... There are healers who do not have AoE damage spells, right? You have to keep that in mind. So you have Acid Rain, which is an AoE damage spell. Then you have Stormkeeper, right? And then you have Chain Lightning, Lava Burst, uh, Lightning... Like, you have all of these damage spells, right? I, I think... I don't see why you would be worried about the damage. Because, yeah, technically it's possible... That the damage abilities don't do a lot of damage, right? Like, that's obviously a possibility. But that's not something that we should worry about now, because obviously it's just a number thing. So if Acid Rain doesn't do not enough damage, they can just buff it. They can say, oh, Acid Rain does 50% more damage now, you know? I would be more worried if I was a healer that doesn't have enough spells, right? Because there are certain healers who just do not have spells to do damage with. And then the numbers can't fix that at that point, right? Like, for example, Rastadrude, I guess, only really has cat form swipe as AoE and Sunfire. And that is like... I would say Acid Rain is quite a lot better than that, right? Technically. But yeah, I think it should be fun. Then, what else did I... Oh, I wanted to try Wells. Oh, I did try that. Then, deeply rooted elements. Uh, casting Riptide has 7% chance to activate Ascendance for 6 seconds. Okay. Then, with Earth Warden, increases the healing of Earth living by 50%. If we're going to target the target below 10. Oh. Yeah, that's just like a passive kind of hot thing if you want to go with it, I guess. So I guess this is really good. 7% chance is pretty low. But you cast a decent amount of Riptide, so... I 
I don't know. Can the fifth free Riptide proc ascendance? Yeah, I assume so. But it does say casting Riptide. So I don't think, like, if you proc a second Riptide, I don't think that you would have a 14% chance. It would only be seven. Because you're not actively casting that Riptide, it's just a proc, right? At least I assume so. Hey, Grand Siri, thank you so much. I'm glad you like my content. On demand healings to be better than a random proc. Yeah, but um, you can take multiple downstairs talents, right? Like you can you can take multiple um, of these bottom talents. You have the points to do that. I mean, I don't at the moment because I'm only level sixty. But uh, you will have eight more points to spend, so you can even take three. You could take Deeply Rooted Elements, Ascendance, and one of these. You would have enough points to do that, if you wanted to. Okay. Yeah, I obviously don't know enough about Rasta Shaman to, like... Like understand which path you would be taking or whatever, but it seems pretty fun. Lots of choices, lots of different kinds of playstyles. You can do like more of a, like a hot heavy, like a riptide heavy kind of build, and I can do more of like a like a chain heal build, I guess. And uh, you know, you can do a, like ascendance or no ascendance. You can have more passive hots. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'll. Seems pretty nice. Yeah, I don't think Wellspring... Um, like... I don't think Wellspring is bad. Um, but it's definitely... I would say that it's, it's definitely a, pretty, a little bit of a situ situational heal, right? Because the problem with it is that, first of all, um, you need to be positioned properly to use it. Because it's it's a small cone starting from you and then spreading out. Like, it becomes really big. But, um, like, imagine you're doing Halondris. Then this spell is probably, like, whatever, right? I think this is a this is a spell that is really good on fights where you're more stacked up. Um, you don't have to be like super stacked, but like slightly more stacked, right? It would probably also be good in a fight like um, Jailer, I guess. You do have to aim it properly though. Um, but yeah, this is definitely it's definitely not an N plus spell, right? You're never gonna take this in N plus. It's definitely more of an AoE thing. Because it also doesn't seem to have a cap, which is really good. Most AoE heals have a cap in a, in a way. Unless it's a long cooldown. So it's interesting that this doesn't have a cap. Did it used to have a cap? Yeah, because it just doesn't seem to be having a cup anymore. And that's pretty good. Oh, it used to be more effective if it hit five targets. Oh. Okay. Yeah, so then it would have been maybe a bit better for M+. Plus. All right. Okay. We could technically look at enhancement. Oh, I was just like so completely uninterested in Enhancement Shaman, it's insane. Sorry, Kana. <laughs> enhancement is like one of the spacks where I'm just like, no. I would never play this spec. Ever. You would have to force me to play this spec. 
<laughs> you would have to literally force me to play this. Yeah, I already looked at the elemental. Elemental looked really fun. I'm, I'm a big fan of the elemental um, talents. Looks really, really cool. Alright, so we can add a look at enhancement. Okay, you know what? Let's quickly look at it. We might as well. We looked at the other two specs. Uh, thank you so much for 20 months, Danny. What's up? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, we're going to quickly look at the elemental. And then afterwards, we're going to look at which was the class that was second in votes? Was it priest? No, it was rogue. What was it? Because <laughs> we did a poll earlier on which talents I should be looking at. And I forgot which class was second. Was it rogue? Uh, you think rest is a little too much as compared to other healers? Why would anyone pick any other healer if someone brings so much? I don't think Shaman brings... Like, they didn't actually gain more than what they had before, right? Or did they miss something? Like, the amount of utility that Shaman brings is uh, Spirit Link, Ankh Totem, um, then, what is it called? Uh, Ancestral Vigor? Healing Tide. That's kind of it, right? Lust doesn't matter. Lust doesn't count. We're talking about rating, right? Oh, wait, are you talking about M plus? Or rating? Because that's a big difference. Because Bloodlust in rating is completely irrelevant. Because you're definitely going to have one class that has bloodlust. Right? You don't need a shaman to lust. In a plus, on the other hand, lust is a lot more value. Because there's only five players that can provide it, right? But yeah, for raiding, I don't think... like. I was also... I was always a person that thought shaman has too much utility for a healer. I always thought shamans were just too strong. Um, because shamans, in comparison to other healers, have, in my opinion, way more like rage utility. And that kind of always made them really good. And the only time shamans are not good is when their healing is incredibly underwhelming. Which did happen in Sepulchre, right? But in my opinion, if the shaman, like if the healing throughput is decent, then they will always have a spot, I think. Like, but they don't even need to have good healing. They just need to have average healing, I think. If they do okay healing, like average healing, then I think they have a spot. Because of all of the stuff that they had with Spirit Link, right? Spirit Link, uh, Ankh Totem, uh, Ancestral whatever it's called, Vigor, um, yeah, I mean, that alone is already really good, and Healing Tide. But then, of course, as a Parker, the healing was so bad that uh, most player, most guilds didn't run with them. And a lot of this, I guess another problem in Parker was a lot of the fights were really, really spread out. And shamans lose a lot of value if you're super spread out because of all a lot of your spells are just more contained, right? Thank you so much for 22 months. Reject what's so. Um so yeah, I don't think shaman will ever have an issue uh with utility. The only time they will have an issue is if their healing throughput is just like very bad. And that barely ever happens. Like, I think Shaman almost always had a spot in raiding, except in Sepulchre where it was really underwhelming. But usually Shaman is like just perfectly fine, you know. 
Um, there's other classes with much bigger issues. Like a class like Holy Priest and Rester Druid and Mistweaver. Those three classes, they lack a lot of utility in comparison to Paladin, Disc Priest and Rester Shaman. And that's why you barely ever saw Rester, Rester Druids, Mistweavers and Holy Priest being played. Um, except like later on. When you didn't need uh, rate utility anymore, because rate re rate utility is really only needed in like I would say like cutting edge like gameplay in a sense, because rate utility um, is super important to survive certain things, but it loses a lot of value if you easily survive stuff, right? Like if there's incoming damage, but you really easily um, survive it then you would rather have more healing than damage reduction. Because damage reduction is only really useful if people are, like in, if people have the possibility of actually dying. But if you don't have the possibility of actually dying, then healing throughput is technically better. And that's why at the start, when the raid comes out for the first time, and during the race world first, and during like the top 50 kills, you usually see a lot of like damage reduction healers in the raids, at least historically, like Disc Priest, Paladin, Shaman. And then later on, when normal guilds kill the bosses, they usually don't need that many Paladins, Shamans, Disc Priests anymore, and they can just bring the other healers, right? Now, Sepulchre was different, of course, because Sepulchre had a lot more incoming damage rather than um, like bigger hits. And the healing of Rest Druid and Holy Priest was also just like absolutely insane as well, so that was the other thing. Uh, but yeah. Yeah, until the gear catches up, basically, yeah. Sorry, we wanted to look at Enhancement, though. So yeah, I don't think Shaman will ever have issues with utility, like, ever. I think they're always fine. Okay, uh, give me one second, and then we're going to look at these enhancement talents, okay? Be right back.
All right. Enhancement Shaman. Let's take a look. Okay, honestly, I have no idea how you play Enhancement Shaman, so this is going to be interesting. Okay, let's see. What's my master? Increase your chance to trigger a Stormbringer and win fear by a percent. Increase all fire, frost, and nature damage you deal by. Okay. So, my main spells are just my mastery. And then I'm gonna get Chain Lightning as default. Then Storm Strike. Okay. Um, requires 100 melee weapon. Okay. Uh, energizes both your weapons with lightning and delivers a massive blow to your target, dealing a total of around. Oh, no. So. From what I understand, the way enhancement shaman works is a lot, um, like a lot of, um, like melee attack buffs, right? So you're like pressing things and your melee attacks do more damage, stuff like that, right? Yeah. Okay, so this is one of them. Then wind fury weapon, imbue your main hand weapon with the elements of wind, for one hour each main hand attack has to trigger two extra attacks. Yeah, so this is wind fury. Um. So you can yet wait. Can you have Storm Strike and Wind Fury at the same time? Oh no, Storm Strike is not a buff. True. This is this is a buff. Okay, so this is an attack. Then Lava Lash is also um, just an attack. Okay, and then improved Maelstrom weapon. Uh, wait, where's Maelstrom weapon? Oh, it's here. Oh, you have it by default. Oh, I see. Uh, when you deal damage with a melee weapon, you have a chance to gain Maelstrom weapons, stacking up to five times. Each stack of Maelstrom uh, reduces the cast time of your next damage of healing cell by 10%. A maximum of five stacks of Maelstrom weapon can be consumed at a time. So this basically makes the spell instant. Okay. And then this master of weapon increases the damage or healing spells. Okay. So this is basically omen of clarity, for ferals. Except it's sex. Instead of it being immediately instant. Okay. Then master weapon can now stack five additional times. So that means you can have ten stacks and then cast two instant spells. Yeah. Again, like omen of clarity stacking up twice. Kinda. Okay, then, um, launch at your enemy at Ghost Wolf, fighting them to deal physical damage. So this is, uh, Feral Charge. With a long cooldown. Then, Lava Lash. Lava Lash cooldown reduced by 3 seconds, and Lava Lash is used against the target affected by your Flame Shock. Flame Shock will be spread up to 2 tar okay. So it's like an AoE kinda thing-ish. Okay, then Primal Lava Actuators. Shun Flame Frog Shock deals periodic damage. Increase the damage of your next Lava Lash by 12%. Reduce the cooldown of Lava Lash. Okay. So this basically just means that you're going to be able to spread your flame shocks more often, right? So you spread flame shocks with lava lash, and then each time flame shock does damage, you have a like you reduce lava lash and then you spread it again. So it's like a cycle thing, I guess. And then uh, primal primer. Melee attacks with flame tongue active. Melee attacks with flame tongue active. Where's flame tongue? Where's flame tongue? 
You have a baseline? Oh, it's like a shaman spell. Oh, okay. Imbue your weapon with the elements for one hour, causing each of your attacks to deal additional fire damage. Okay. So I guess you... So you can have like Wind Fury in one and then Flame Tongue on the other? Technically? Okay. But you could have Wind Fury on both. Right? Hey. Um, <laughs> okay. Start with Massima Tin Stucky. Oh, Massima? Ja. Okay. Mach da Mask, mach da da. Mach da da, ja, man kennt man. Bringt die Stücke zusammen. Okay. Mm -hmm. Alright, um. Oh, you're not able to do that. Ah, so you can't do double Wind Fury. So you can do one Wind Fury, one Flame Tongue. What else can you do? Is there any more buffs? That you can put on weapons? No, so you always have one flame tongue, one wind fury. Okay, okay. So, um. Okay, so middle attacks with flame tongue active. Increase the damage the target takes from your next lava lash by seven, second up to ten times. Okay, so if you, if you run with primal primer, you. Lava Lash, less, I guess. But then at the same time, you also have a longer cooldown, so you kind of press it on cooldown. It's probably going to be 10 stacks every time anyway, because you're going to attack that many times. Unless you have downtime, I guess. So I guess this is like a... Like, if you have perfect uptime, then this is probably good. And this is more of a, like an AoE thing-ish. So this is more single target, this is more AoE. Okay. Then increase all fire, frost, and nature damage. That seems pretty straightforward. <laughs> then Ice Strike. Strike your target with an icy blade, dealing frost damage and snaring them. Ice Strike increase the damage of your next frost shock by 100%. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Kind of whatever. But probably, I mean, this could be good or bad, just depends on numbers, I guess. Like, either you use it or you don't. <laughs> Nothing like super special, I guess. Then uh, Fire Nova. I wrap the burst of fear damage from all targets affected by your flame shock. Dealing 600 fire damage up to six targets within 80 yards of your flame shock targets. That's really good, right? If you run uh, Primal Lava Actuator. Because it kind of scales. It kind of scales like exponentially in a sense. Except that it's target capped, of course. Uh, so, yeah. Okay, well, that's still nice though. Then a hailstorm. Uh, each stack of maelstrom weapon consumed. Increases the damage of your next frost shock by 50% and it costs your next frost shock to hit one additional target up to five. Oh, hmm. Yeah, I guess this is again a number thing because I guess either you run. Hmm. Yeah, so, like, I guess either you run Lava Lash, Primal Lava Actuator plus Fire Nova, or you don't go with this, and just go with this, right? Because then you use your Maelstrom to cast Frost Shock, instead of using your Maelstrom to cast Lava Lash, right? I guess. 
Okay. So it just depends on... Like, either it's like a number thing, or it depends on... Like, the, the fight. I guess this does more burst damage. Compared to, um... The Fire Nova thing? But not sure. I mean, both of it is kind of burst, right? So... You know. Then, Wind Fury. A storm Strike is a 25%... What's Storm Strike? This one, yeah. Uh, to target an additional time for 40% of normal damage, this effect can chain off of itself. Okay, so another, like, AoE kind of, like, cleave thing. Then, Overflowing Maelstrom, your damage or healing spells would, will now consume up to 10... Oh, yeah, we already read this. Yeah, we already read this. Crash Lightning. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Electrocutes all enemies in front of you, dealing nature damage, hitting two or more targets, enhances your weapon for 10 seconds, causing Storm Strike. And Lava Lash to also deal nature damage to all targets in front of you. Okay, another number thing, I guess. Really? Then, Hot Hand. Melee auto attacks with Plain Tongue weapon active have 5% chance to reduce the cooldown of Lava Lash by 75% and increase the damage of Lava Lash by 100% for 8 seconds. Yeah, this is. Uh, it's actually interesting because. Because this um, not only interacts with single target, but also with AoE, if you run this, right? Well, maybe not so much, because I guess the reduction of Lava Lash doesn't necessarily help you that much. If you already have the Flame Tongues, the Flame Shocks active, right? So maybe not. Because there, I guess there's no real point to be able to spam Lava Lash. At least not for AoE. Right, because if you already have Flame Shocks up on all targets, then there's no real point to cast Lava Lash again. At least not for AoE damage, right? Yeah, but it only makes the Lava Lash hit hard, right? And Lava Lash is single target. Oh, you're saying that you get the initial damage of a Flame Shock? Yeah, I guess, uh, I guess, yeah, I guess that makes sense, but it still doesn't interact with this, though, right? So Hot Hands can be good for AoE, but it doesn't interact with, um... Actually, it doesn't interact with this. It just doesn't interact with Fire Nova. It still interacts with Lava Lash and Primal Lava Actuators. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Okay, then Chain Lightning. Each target hit by Chain Lightning reduces cooldown of Crash Lightning. Okay. Okay, so that's also another like AOE stuff again. Because, I mean, Crash Lightning, obviously, is a pretty low cooldown already, 7.8. Well, actually... Oh, no, 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 it's fine. Yeah, yeah, Mm-hmm, okay. Then Sundering. Um... Shut just a line of earth in front of you with your main hand weapon causing flame strike damage and incap any enemies. Oh. Did I already have this cast before? Oh. <laughs> that is so underwhelming. <laughs> yeah. Dude, I, I thought there was just like this huge thing coming out of you. <laughs> 
this really big thing and then he's this tiny spike. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Because it has a 40 second cooldown. Like, I thought it's like, like a big thing. <laughs> and then it's like two yards. <laughs> oh, that is so unfortunate. I'm going to cast it again. Anyway. <laughs> Alright. <laughs> Do wins. Increase your chance to activate Wind Fury to 79%. And Why is this 79? <laughs> Come on, make it 80. Increase damage health on Wind Fury weapon by. Okay. Uh, Storm Ringer. Special attacks have a 6 minutes to reset the cooldown on Storm Strike. Your special attacks? What is a special attack? Is that just like a buffed attack? So special attack is Storm Strike and and Lava Lash. Okay. So if we cast Lava Lash or Storm Strike, you have a chance of resetting Storm Strike. Okay. Then Elemental Blast. Times to the raw power of the elements dealing elemental damage and increasing your critical of our own. Yeah, okay, so this is the RNG Fiesta. Proof Storm Bringer. Storm Bringer now also costs your next Storm Strike to deal. Wait, what's Stormbringer? Oh, so just if this procs. So if you reset the cooldown of Stormstrike, then you also deal more damage with it. Okay. Then, blast your target with a primordial wave, dealing elemental damage? Oh, yeah. Your next sliding bolt will also hit all targets affected by your flame shock for when it is a normal damage. Okay. Uh, Primal Maelstrom. Primordial Wave generates 5 stacks of Maelstrom weapon. Oh, 10 stacks. Damn. Even though I would say 10 stacks is a bit weird, no? Like, this can be slightly awkward to use, no? Possibly? I mean, maybe not, but... Like, you would have to use all of your stacks before you use it, right? Like, because you don't want to waste Maelstrom stacks, right? So you kind of want to go to 10 stacks and use abilities and then use Maelstrom weapon? Or you use it at 5 exactly or something? On AoE, you fully hard cap all the time? Oh, okay, then I guess it doesn't matter. But then this is also weak. On AoE. If you get so many stacks anyway, right? And then each additional lightning bolt generated by primarily a wave increases your haste. But, uh -huh. And then gathering storm. Hey, what is this? Clan spirit waves, right? Yeah? Okay. Each target hit by crash lightning increases the damage. I like this. I, I like this because this makes off healing less good. And I think that's kind of important. Because I like having heals as like a hybrid class. Uh, but sometimes it feels like my heals are so fucking weak. And it's not even worth to cast like unless you use something to buff your heals. So I like talents like this. Because I don't think heals are a problem for hybrid classes if it only really heals yourself more. So a talent like this allows them to balance the healing spells to not be too OP when you heal others, but pretty good when you heal yourself. And I like stuff like that. I guess. Yeah, okay now. Okay, then this. Um, each target hit by Crash Light increases the damage of your next storm strike by 2%. Okay. Feral Spirit. Summons two Spirit Wolves that aid you in battle for 15 seconds. They are immune to movement impairing effects. 
Feral Spirit generates one stack of Maelstrom weapon immediately and one stack every three seconds for... Okay, so this is more of a, like, generator, I guess? Maelstrom weapon generator plus, I guess, just damage. Not sure if it's relevant damage or not. <laughs> Probably not. I guess it depends. Then which doctors have wolf bones? Uh-huh. Increase the chance to gain a stack of Maelstrom weapon by 2% and whenever you gain a stack of Maelstrom, the cooldown of Feral Spirits is reduced. Okay. So this seems like m single target stuff, more like. And this also, right? Like this middle area plus this left area seems uh, to be more like single target stuff. And then, well, our active crash lighting costs your wolves to attack all nearby enemies. Oh, okay, now this is AoE. <laughs> Elemental spirits reduce the cooldown of feral spirits brethren and cause your feral spirit to be imbued with fire, frost, and lightning, enhancing your abilities. Hmm. Yeah, I guess I don't really know how maelstrom generation works, but like if it's true that on AoE you generate a lot of maelstrom, then it seems a bit weird that um, there's so much maelstrom generation in here with these talents and then you get a, like an AoE talent here unless like if you can use it then it's fine but otherwise it's uh, slightly weird ish I guess maybe not so weird if you go with um, hailstorm because if you play with hailstorm you can endlessly spend your maelstrom right or is the stress truck have a cooldown oh it does have a cooldown well, that sucks It's only 5 and 2, though. Well, it does spend Maelstrom if you go with this, no? Oh, no, it doesn't. You have to use another ability and then Frost Shock. Oh, okay, I see. Yeah, okay. And then there's a Sentence here. Uh, Swirling Maelstrom Ice Strike and Fire Nova now also grant you two stacks of Maelstrom weapon. Man, there's a lot of Maelstrom generators down here. <laughs> Done. Cool and F Storm Strike and cost you next Storm Strike to deal with Okay. Well, Ascendance is active. Generate one Maelstrom weapon. <laughs> Dude, what? All of this is just Maelstrom generators. Like, all of the talents. <laughs> well, Ascendance is active. Generate one Maelstrom Strike. Oh, okay. Well, as is active, wind strike automatically consumes up to five maelstrom weapons next to discharge a lightning bolt. Okay. Okay, interesting. The spec has a lot of downtime in reality, and maelstrom is used to combat that. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. Yeah, so what do people think of this enhancement talent tree? Is it good? Bad? So-so? Who cares? Should we get? Okay, perfect. Well, that is good to hear. Like 9.5 out of 10. Well, there you go. Amazing then. <laughs> well, that is good. Well, cool, cool. I mean, I'm not, I'm not incredibly impressed by the Enhancement Shaman talent tree, let's be honest here. But that mo mm, I think that has mainly something to do with me not really liking Enhancement Shaman at all. <laughs> I do like the Elemental Shaman Tree though. That one looks really cool. And I also like the, the Rest Shaman Tree, but it doesn't tell me much because I don't play Rest Shaman. But the Elemental seems really nice. I'm a big Elemental fan. Man, I'm a bit jealous, honestly, because um, because this shaman tree looks so much better than my monkey tree. <laughs> Man, so they they took your spec and they just solved all of your issues in like a cool way. And with Moonkin, they took our spec and solved absolutely nothing. It's a bit unfortunate, I do have to admit. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I'm a shaman main now. 
And you can be a male panda. And there's nothing better than a male panda. I mean, let's be honest. Look at them. Look at those cutie pies. Oh, look how cute he is. <laughs> look at him jump. Female panda is not better than male panda. Hey, 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 Bishu, take that back. You take that back right now. <laughs> Only complaint about rest of class tree in a plus is when you pick utility, you have almost no points over, which is boring. Mm, why is that? Oh, are you basically saying that the problem is that the healing spells are all the way in the left and then there's some utility all the way in the right? Is that the problem? I can see that being an issue. Because like Hex is here, for example. And Cleanse is here. So you definitely have to go here. But then you also want this. I guess. Guess of Winter's also here. Yeah, it looks like a lot of the good utility stuff is like on this side of the trio, which obviously benefits enhancement, for example, but not so much um, resto and elemental. There's also just more throughput on the class tree for resto. Yeah, like earlier I was specking into the class tree for elemental, and it looked like there was not much that was actually like affecting your damage a lot, so you were really free to choose whatever you want. I like that, I think. It's the same with the druid tree as well. The druid tree is very, very heavy utility based. And there's very few talents that actually buff your damage. Because obviously whenever there's something that buffs your damage or your throughput, you kind of want to take it. So, and I'm not the biggest fan of that in the class tree. Because the spec tree is the thing that gives you power. And the class tree is the thing that gives you utility. And I... I like it when you're more free to choose whatever you want in the class tree. Because then you can really cater it towards what you need, right? If you do in plus, you go for more like CC and stuff. And if you do raid, you go for more maybe defensives and so on, right? But if you're kind of um, forced to go with certain talents, then that kind of stops that uh, creativity with the talent tree. And I hate that a little. But yeah, it looked like Elemental did not have that issue necessarily. As I was going through the elemental um, tree, it seemed like there was like two talents or something that he kind of needed. And other than that, it was fine. But for healers, I guess this whole left side is somewhat important, right? You have chain heal, earth shield. Kind of want this too. Totem reduction, not sure if you want that. Mana spring. Yeah, I don't know. Ancestral Guidance. Mm, yeah, I guess. Yeah. Healing Stream. And then there's... Critical Chance of Nature Spells, which seems to be pretty good as well for Rasta Shaman, right? And then Perch. My Perch here. I always kind of need that. And I guess stone skin. Hmm. Yeah, I see the issue. I see the issue. I mean, obviously, you go astral shift, right? You mean this one? Oh, increase the duration of your healing stream, mana spring, tremor, poison. Oh, which one do you mean? Uh, middle talent, second from the bottom. You mean this one? Totemic focus? No, so the way the talent tree works is that um, it alternates. So if you, um, like if you are level 71, 
you get like a talent point for the class tree. And then when you're 72, you get a talent point for enhancement. And then it back again, like it just alternates. And we're not actually gonna go 72, but you know what I mean. Dude, I don't see anything. <laughs> okay, let's do another class now. Shaman looks really good though, I'm a big fan. Okay, let's take a look at... Um, let's look at Hunter. Or should we look at something else? Oh wait, what was the poll? What did the poll say? It said rogue. Okay, let's look at rogue then. I wanna be a uh, void elf. Uh, yeah, whatever. <laughs> you saying Rogue is super OP? That's interesting because I read, I talked to you. Uh... A force of oh, shit, I'm a different area. Oh. Okay, fuck it. New character. Human. Um, I heard Baba talk about Rogue and he said it seems really OP. Yeah? And it's funny because I think Rogue is so problematic because Rogue has by far like the most like utility that out of any class I think when it comes to like mythic plus and PvP. Like they just have like infinite amounts of stuff. In my opinion, right? Like they have single target suns and single target interrupts and more single target suns. And they have stealth and they have vanish and they have distract and they have sap and they have silence and they have uh, Lots of different kinds of defensives like cloak and evasion and cheat death and feint. You know, they just have like so much stuff. They have tricks of the trade. It's just so many things that they have. They have blind um, and shroud. And it just feels like it, it feels like it's this never ending utility that they have. But the biggest problem with Rogue is that all of this utility is completely useless in a raid. Because you can the bosses are immune to all of your spells, to all of that utility, right? And that creates a really big issue because their utility is incredibly underwhelming in a raid, but really overpowered in a plus and in PvP. So how do you solve that issue? Like, what do you do? How do you fix that? How do you make their utility better in the raids without making them even better in and plus in PvP? It would have to be certain buffs that only really affect you in a raid, I guess. It doesn't work in a plus in PvP, right? But I don't think that's what they did. <laughs> anyway. So what do we look at first? Uh, Asa? Yeah, I don't know how rogues work in general, so it's gonna be a bit interesting. <laughs> I just don't know. Oh! Wait, rogue has a lot of baseline spells. Huh? I think this is the first spec I looked at that had so many baseline spells. Almost all other specs that I looked at 
only have their mastery as baseline. And all the other spells needed to be talented in. So I think it's very interesting that Rogue has four baseline spells already. Rupture, Knife, Mutilate, and, and Venom. Interesting. I guess that might be the case because a lot of other classes that I looked at so far were um, hybrid classes. So a lot of the hybrid classes had all of their baseline spells in the class spell book instead of the spec spell book. Maybe that explains it. Because something like um, Solar Wrath or Moonfire, they're all like class talents or class abilities. Well, it looks like like, Rogue doesn't have any class abilities that are damage spells, really, other than Ambush, I guess. All the other things are more like utility stuff. Well, and Slice and Dice, I guess. Yeah, they do have survivability, but a lot of classes have survivability. In fact, all of them do. <laughs> like, every single class has defensive stuff. There's some classes that are a bit weaker than others. But I don't think Rogue... When it comes to survivability, I don't think Rogue is necessarily much stronger in rates compared to others. They used to be... Rogues used to be super broken when it came to survivability. Because of the way faint works. But now their faint is like not as strong anymore as it used to be. And it also costs more and stuff. So yeah, their their defensives are good, but not like outstanding, I wouldn't say. So yeah, let's look at the class tree. So Garot is um, default if you're a Essa. Then you have Sap and Blind here, Evasion. Faint. Cloak. Man, all of these talents seem very mandatory. Well, I guess you don't need sap when you're raiding, and you don't need blind when you're raiding. But you want faint, so you kind of need blind anyway. And you also want cloak, so you need sap anyway. Okay, I didn't realize how messed up this is, actually. I'm never a fan of optional utility that is... Like, I'm never a fan of utility that is forced upon you. And it... Definitely looks like Sap is forced on you and blind too. Because, I mean, when do you not need Cloak of Shadows? Like, Cloak is such a spell that, like, you almost always want Cloak, right? But you don't... Like, Sap is much more... Um, much less important. Because, like, what do you do in a raid with Sap? Like, it's a completely useless ability in raiding, right? Of course, Sap is really good in PvP and in and plus. But yeah, in raiding, uh, Sap is a like, completely useless spell, right? Same with blind. But anyway. It's fine because it's only a few spells, uh, a few points that you spend, so it's okay. And the tree kind of fans out, so I think it's not that bad. But you have to take it. Then, Master Poison increases the non-damaging uh, effects of your weapon poisons by 20%. Oh, okay, that's good. And then Wound Poison can move stack, um, stack two additional times. Okay, so this is utility, uh, It's and it's on the side, so you don't have to take it if you don't need it, which is great. Then, Shadow Runner, while Stealth or Shadow Dance is active, you move 10% faster. Good. Your builds uh, uh, require Stealth can still be used for 3 seconds after Stealth. Okay, so this is again on the side, and it's more of a PvP thing. And maybe M+, plus, but more like PvP. And this as well. Then... Gouge, rush setup. The energy cost of kinesh shot, cheap shot, sap, and distract or reduce by 20%. Trick to the trades. Okay, let me... I'm gonna try to make a raiding build. And this is gonna be very interesting, I think. Because... <laughs> I have a feeling... That when you're raiding... There's barely any points that are really useful to you. In the class tree. But when you're... Playing PvP or M+, plus, then you want to take, like, everything. That's what I have a feeling, at least. Like, it's like, 
because of the thing that I said before, where most of the utility is not really useful in raids. Okay, so uh, Nimble Fingers, I think, would be good for the raids. For self-heal and stuff. This is useless in a raid. Trix is okay for the raid. Not really needed, but yeah. Then cuts your weapon non-lethal. That says what? Well, check it. This is also not really useful in a raid. So now I'm already stuck, right? I don't think any well, of these welcome, talents Tyler help Lincoln. me in the raid. I don't need my poisons really in the raid that much. I don't need gouge. I don't need kidney shot, cheap shot, sap, distract. I don't need stealth. So now it's kind of, but it, I only have to spend one more point, so it's whatever, I guess. I think it's not a sub stores. I appreciate that. Though. I guess we would take Master Poisoner in case we need a certain poison. Then Iron Stomach. Increase the healing. You need this? Why? It says increases the non-damaging effects of your weapon poisons. So this is just uh, utility. Yeah? yeah, you didn't read this correctly, Ashes. It says non-damaging effects. So it doesn't help you damage. It just makes your utility do, like, work better. Unless I'm not understanding this. Need for a traffic poison? Okay, what's a traffic poison? Where's that? Or is it somewhere over here? Oh god, where is it? Sentry fourth row. Oh there. Close your weapon with a non-lethal poison that lasts for one hour. Each strike has a 10% chance of poisoning the enemy, reducing the damage by 3% for 10 seconds. Mm. Okay. Yeah, I guess it's kind of OP. So I guess you do want this then. <laughs> yeah, that seems kind of interesting. <laughs> All right, interesting. Yeah, then this makes sense. Okay, then uh, increase the healing you receive from Crimson Vial, healing potion, and health stones. Yeah, I would take this now, I guess. And Shadow Step. And then I guess you need some of this stuff to go down here. Let's see. Um, what's this? Pray in the weak. Enemies disabled by your... Okay, this is useless. Reduce cooldown of sprint. I think this is nice, but not really needed. Like, depends on the fight, I guess. This is really good, though. I would definitely go with this. Um, thanks for five months, AC. What's up? Thank you, thank you. Happy Friday. This is useless for raids. Salt and dice heals you for up to 1% of your maximum health for, for two seconds. That's fine, but also not really needed, I would say. This is useless. Then, increase the critical selections of your attacks at the generic combo points. Okay, this is really good. Okay, so now all of a sudden there's damage spells here. Oh my god, there's all damage spells. Okay, so this is supposed to be... For assassination, this is supposed to be for outlaw, and this is uh, Sephiroth, right? Shadow Dance. Okay. So I guess I want to go down this side. So we'll take this. Poison damage. And then, I guess it would make sense to go down another path, like, completely. You know what I mean? Like, I don't think I want to waste um, a point here, for example. Uh, 
And I think the best thing to go with here, I mean, I don't know. But maybe versatility? Like it's 4% flat burst. That seems pretty good. I guess energy of finishing move reduce is also good, but I don't know how important that is as assassination rogue. So maybe going down here would make the most sense. One, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So we get rid of this. Whatever, we don't need shadow step. So we go here. That's a leeching poison effect of your deadly poison wound poison during 10% leech, okay. Critical strike chance increased by 1%. What's this? Can also reduce all damage taken from non-area effects. Ooh, that's pretty good actually. Elusiveness. Vigor, increase your maximum energy by 50 and your energy regen. Okay, I'm not sure if this is good. When you crit strike with a melee attack that generates combat points, you have 50% chance to gain an additional combat point. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if any of this... This is just like a number thing, right? Like, obviously, I don't know. Yeah, like, <laughs> I obviously don't know, like... It's, it's a number thing, right? Because there's a lot of damage stuff in here. So I think it's just like, how valuable are some of these damage traits? Because if they're really valuable, then you would want to give up some utility for it, I guess. And then I don't know where you want to go. Do you want to go Shadow Dance? Do you want to go left? Like, where do you want to go? You know, like, it's... I think this is really hard to tell without, like, actually theory crafting the numbers. Hey, Emma, what's up? I just waved lovely behind us up. Oh, they just now left? Oh, shit. How was your time? What a week. I know, right? <laughs> oh, what did you guys do today? Okay, let's look at the, essen the asset tree. Um... Okay, wait. So, deadly poison. Mm -hmm. Set of knives. With poisons, while stealth is active, your attacks always apply your active lethal and non lethal. Okay. Oh, wait! There's the same talent twice? So you just got a second charge? Ah, okay. Interesting. <laughs> okay. And then it extends the duration of slice and dice by up to one second per combo point. Then. Okay. Then all right planning your finishing moves grant four percent increased damage done for four seconds. Seems good enough. Application chance of poisons increased. And then this is a traffic poison, yeah. Shadow stuff cooldown is reduced, but when used on a target, deflected by your go around. Uh, this is more of a PvP thing here, I guess. This uh, right wing here. And then this is AoE. So this is like AoE, this is PvP. And you have shift. This is uh, just AoE spender. 
Your mutilate and auto attack steal 30% of other as nature damage charts affect by at least one of your weapon poisons. Okay. Hmm, that seems really good for um for AoE, right? Well, it depends. I guess uh like it's only 25%. And also like how much damage do your auto attacks do? Like, do you have anything that buffs your auto-attacks? Or are your auto-attacks just, like, normal auto-attacks? Because then I guess it doesn't do that much. I don't know. Death mark. Your third highest damage is rogue or auto-attacks? Well, I guess then it's good. Mutilate refunds 8 energy when used against a poison target. Ambush and Mutilate have a turn of chance to make your next ambush free. And you solve without stealth. Chance increased by if the target is under a cam. Like an execute kind of thing. The poison and bleed steal 10% increased damage to targets below. Another execute. And then shift deal 7 increased damage and no longer costs energy. Yeah. Okay. Tiny Toxic Blade. <laughs> then what is this? Dragon Tempered Blades. You may apply one additional lethal and no use of to your weapon. Oh, okay. That's interesting. Thanks for six months, Saber Tooth. I appreciate that. Thank you, thank you. That's so weird, Moonkin build. I know, right? What's this? Indiscriminate Carnage. Your next Garrode and your next Rupture also apply to all enemies within tiny yards of the target, dealing reduced damage beyond eight targets. Oh, only reduced damage, though. Yeah, this seems really good. It's definitely more sustained damage, but I guess that's generally a thing that... Like, I think as a rogue was never... A spec that did, like, burst AoE damage or something, right? They were always more, like, insane... Um, like, sustained damage. So, I mean, it makes sense. Yeah, Rogue definitely seems like they're having some good stuff, for sure. Sanguinate. Twist your blades into the target's wounds, causing your bleed effects on them to bleed out 100% faster. Oh, that's also really good. So you you reduce your ramp up time. That's really good, I think. Well, self is active and for free, so it just increase. Okay. Iron wire. Increase the duration of garrotes. Silence effect. Okay. Okay. Lethal dose. Deal 1% increased damage to targets for each of your poison and bleed effects on them. Okay, that's more of a single target talent. And then mutilate deals an additional 30% bleed damage over 8 seconds. Stepsis. Infect the target's blood. Dealing 3.5k nature damage over 10 seconds. If the target survives its full duration, they suffer an additional 1.4k damage and you gain one use of any stealth ability for 5 seconds. Huh. Will only reduce by 30 seconds if sepsis does not last its full duration. Hmm. Yeah, that's, uh, that seems good enough. This is kind of cool. And then you regain 5 energy each time your garrote or rupture deal bleed damage to a poison target. If an enemy dies while afflicted by your rupture, you regain energy based on its remaining duration. Okay. Poison bomb. And, and venom and rupture have a 4% chance per combo point spent to smash a vial of poison at the target's location, creating a pool of acidic death. The deals 1k nature damage over 2 seconds to all enemies within it. Okay. Thanks for 5 months, Poco. What's up? Sadly, my schedule doesn't match your streaming schedule anymore, but I still enjoy your clips on TikTok. Aww. That really sucks. But I'm so glad you're still subbing and still watching my TikTok videos. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much, Poka. Yeah, I remember when poison damage was really good, yeah. Cut your weapon with a lethal poison that lasts for one hour. Each strike has a 3% chance to poison an enemy, dealing nature damage and applying amplification for 12 seconds. And Venom and can consume 15 seconds of amplification to deal 3% increased damage. Okay. 
And then also uh, increase the critical strike chance of your poisons by 5% and their crit strike chance by 5 energy. And generates 5 energy. Hmm. This seems like a funnel thing. Interesting, because usually sub rogue is a funnel rogue. But maybe this funnel is not as strong as the sub rogue funnel, I guess. But yeah, Rapture increases your agility by 3, and you get it for every Rapture you have up. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's really good for Funnel, for a plus AoE pulls and stuff. Okay, so which rogue, um... Which rogue spec seems the best right now? Outlaw, okay. Let's see what the outlaw can do. Oh, outlaw has already two options at the start. That's interesting. I think that's the first class I see that has two options as their first. I think all other class only had one. Uh, so this is strike is at 25% of the chance to uh, additional time, making your next pistol shot half cost and double damage. Okay. Plate flurry. Adrenaline rush. Grappling hook. Between the eyes. Evasion? Oh, that's the second stack of evasion, I guess. Reduce the cooldown of grappling hook by 15 seconds and increases retraction speed. Okay! That's nice. Reduce the cooldown of blind by 30 seconds and increases range. Okay, that's PvP. 50% chance for combo points to spend greater combo points. Okay. Then, Weapon Master. Since the strike is from the chance to increase the uh, 200 strike additional time, roll the bones. And then, main gauge is an additional 5% to strike while Blade Floor is active. Okay. Between the eyes and the 5% chance per combo point, spent to grant 4 combo points. Okay. Hit and run. Movement speed increased by 15%. Woo! You can get 30% movement speed? As an adult rogue? What the hell? That's so fast. Wait, I need to skill this right now. I wanna see how fast I am. Okay, that's pretty fast. Like, look how fast I am. It's like I'm on a mount. Yeah, I'm so fast. <laughs> what the hell? I'm literally sprinting right now. <laughs> I love that. Okay, then. Your finishing moves have a 20% chance per combo point spent to grant a combo point. Build a dice, activating adrenaline rush costs your next roll of the bones to grant at least two matches. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, finishing moves reduces the remaining cooldown of many rogue skills. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> oh, they actually say it. Okay, I see it now. <laughs> I thought they were literally just say many skills, and then they don't actually like say which ones. Okay, effective skills is adrenaline rush, between the eyes, blade flurry, grappling hook. Keep it rolling, roll the bones, sepsis, shadow dance, sprint, thistle tea, and vanish. Okay. Then, uh, roll the bones with 10% chance of granting additional matches. What does that mean, um, additional matches? That just mean you get um, multiple buffs? Or what? So if I use Adrenaline Rush, and then I use Roll the Bones, c 
could I get three buffs? Or even four? Could I get four buffs? Hmm. Okay. Then float like a butterfly. Restless blades now also reduces the remaining cooldown of evasion. Okay. Then half cost uses of pistol shot granted by sinister strike now generate one additional combo point and deal. Okay. One point five minute cooldown. Strike at an enemy, dealing one k physical damage and empowering your weapon for ten seconds, causing your sinister strike, ambush, and pistol shot to fill your combo points. But your finishing moves consume five percent of your current health. Oh, I don't care about that. Just heal me. Increase the range of your melee attacks by three yards while Blade Four is active. Oh, do you not have increased range other than this? As outlaw? So it's only this? In the class tree? Then, uh, Blade Flurry strikes three additional enemies and its duration increased by three seconds. Nice. Summon increase by 10%. I don't need health. Just heal me. Space now also reduces the rain color of it. Uh huh? The offhand attacks have turned to generate ten energy, increases your energy regeneration, uh, gain regeneration max combo point. You okay, so all of this like energy stuff. Count the odds. Ambush and dispatch have a ten percent chance to grant you a roll of the bones combat enhancement buff you do not already have. Duration and chance tripled while stealthed. Okay. Heavy hitter. Ember supercharges one combo point for 45 seconds. Finishing moves that consume the same number of combo points as your supercharge function. As if they consume seven combo points. Wait, what? Sorry, what? <laughs> Ember supercharges one combo point. Finishing moves that consume the same number of combo points as your supercharge function. As if... I'm sorry, is this an English sentence? <laughs> I'm so confused. Uh, finishing moves <laughs> that consume the same number of combo points as your supercharge. Ah, it's, okay, I got it now. Okay, it's an English, it's an, uh, sorry, my brain is a bit slow. Function as if they consume, ah, okay, I got it now. No, I don't get it, I don't think. <laughs> I don't get it. What does that mean? Consume the same number of combo points as you supercharge. So say it charges combo point number two, then you use a finisher with two points and it hits like it was with seven. Okay, but, uh, so what if my second combo point charges up, but I have five combo points? And then I use an ability to cost five combo points? What happens then? So you need to use the combo point that is supercharged, as in, if the second point is supercharged, you have to use a two combo point ability. Okay, I got it. So if I have five combo points and my fourth combo point is supercharged, then I have to spend my points and then somehow get four combo points and then spend those. Okay. Okay, I got it. Interesting. 
Then half cost uses of pistol shot have effect to cause your next ambush to be useful with that stealth. Chance to strike this effect matches the chance of you as soon as you strike to strike an additional time. Okay. Strikes an enemy dealing uh, one k physical damage and causing the target to talk to take ten percent increased damage from your ability for ten seconds. Okay. Triple threat. Sinister strike has a ten percent chance to strike with both weapons after it strikes an additional time. Okay. Sepsis. We this is an ability that uh, assassination also has, right? Then taken by surprise, haste increased by ten percent while stealthed, and for twelve seconds after leaving stealth. Okay, it's a PVP thing, I guess. Well, I guess you can also use it in plus. Then blade rush. Restless Blades also affects party members within 40 yards, reducing the remaining cooldown of a major offensive ability by 2.2 seconds per combo point spent. Restless Blades. Two moves reduce the remaining cooldown of many rogue skills. Zero point two seconds. Zero point two seconds. How much is that? One second for five combo points spent. Yeah, but like. Like, when I said how much is that, I didn't mean literally. I meant, like, how much does it add up to in, like, a minute, you know? 20 seconds per minute? Really? That's a lot. Hmm. I mean, this is basically Fey Guardians from a priest. Except for rogues now. Do priests still have fake guardians in their talent tree now? Or is it gone? Or can you stack it? Can you... I don't think they do. Okay. So I guess this kind of replaces fake guardians. Except it's for your group. I think I like it better for a group. Than, a, than for a single person. Because I do think there actually aren't, like, not every single spec in the game benefits from this. Because some classes have, like, multiple cooldowns and they need to all line up, right? Um, so if only one big ability gets cooldown reduction, then that doesn't really help you. Because you still need to wait for the other cooldowns to come back up, right? So this ability is mainly good for classes that only have, like, one bigger cooldown um it usually is really good for a mage fire mage so you get you can bust back up quicker right um it's usually good for what else was it good for a demo it was good for demo um i guess technically it now would also be good for moonkin <laughs> because moonkin only has ca ca or incarnation you don't have to line it up with anything anymore nowadays. But the cooldown is pretty weak, so I guess it's whatever. But yeah, there's definitely some classes that do not want cooldown reduction on their... Well, not that they don't want it, but they, like it's irrelevant. Like, they, they don't care about it, you know? So... Interesting. It's also... It's also kind of interesting that this is, like, outlaw rogue specific? Hmm. That seems a bit weird. Like, why does outlaw get such a good raid utility? That almost seems like... Yeah, I understand they have a raid buff like this. 
But what about the other specs? Like, what about Asa and Sup? Yeah, Asa has a 3% DR. Every Volkers has a specific rate utility? Oh, but why? I mean, it's honestly a bit messed up, though. Oh, Sup doesn't have anything? Honestly, even if Outlaw and Asa have a different rate utility, that's still a bit, a bit messed up, though. Because almost all other class utilities are class-wide. And I think that's a good thing. Because don't get me wrong, I hate class buffs. I think they would all be gone. But it's still better to have to bring one of them like, for example, in intellect buff, right? If you bring one mage, you have intellect buff. And you don't have to worry about bringing a different mage. You just bring one and it's fine. But for rogue, it almost seems like you kind of want to bring an outlaw rogue. And then you also want to bring an asa rogue. And then technically, you would want to bring maybe even multiple sub rogues. To get the buff on multiple groups. I mean, we'll see. I'm I'm not necessarily against um, spec buffs, because I think spec buffs um, can definitely help out a certain spec that is like under plate or whatever. But I do hate it when you kind of feel like you have to bring a spec. I just I just hate class buffs in general, like. All these kind of buffs. I just hate it when you feel the need to bring them, even if you don't want to. Because it's nice that a. Like, I, I always think it's nice if a class provides a buff. But then at the same time, it, it creates these, like, bad situations where you're, you play with your guild and you want to raid, and then you don't have a rogue player, and all of a sudden you're missing this buff, and you're also missing damage reduction in a boss. Like, not that... Like, I don't think it's necessarily required to have this buff, right? Because I don't think this buff and the damage reduction on a boss is as required as, like, intellect buff, right? Intellect buff surely is better than this. But it still just feels weird to not have it, I feel like. It's like, ah. Oh. PDPS classes shouldn't have spec buffs. I think I agree. I, I think if spec buffs are a thing, it should be hybrid classes that have it. I think. Let me think about this, though. Uh, I mean, or do they? Not sure. Yeah. Okay, so the reason why I don't like spec buffs on full DPS classes, and this is a personal opinion, but I personally don't think that it's incredibly important for all, for a pure DPS spec to have all specs being good. And I know this might be a little bit of a controversial take or whatever, but... In my opinion, if there's a spec that only has damage specs, then it's not the end of the world if one of the specs is not as good as another spec. As long as you have one spec that is good. Because... As long as it's the same role. Because Hunter is different again, right? Because Hunter has one melee spec and two ranged specs. So I think that is different, but... For Rogue, for example, you have three melee specs. And if you, as a player, refuse to play a different spec, well, that's on fucking you then, in my opinion. <laughs> it's like, it's one button away, you know? If assist, like if as a Rogue is like super good, and Outlaw is really garbage, why don't you fucking play as a rogue, you know? <laughs> I 
I don't know. Like, it's not that hard. <laughs> and I understand some people prefer one spec over the other. And I get that. Like, I totally understand if you prefer one spec over the other. But I'm not saying that it would always... Like, it does make sense. So let's say one patch, Asa is really good. And the next patch, Outlaw is really good. And the next patch, Sub is really good. You know, like... As long as it cycles through a bit, I think it's it's okay. Like, I just don't think it's that big of a deal. Like, if you are a player that refuses to play any other spec than one single spec, then does it really matter how good that spec is then? Because, no offense, but then you're probably not like a super good player. <laughs> I guess, right? And does it really matter then if your spec is not that hot right now? Oh. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> does it matter if Moonkin is bad if Feral is good? No, that's not the same thing. Feral is a melee and Moonkin is a range. I think this, like everything that I just mentioned, I only think that makes sense if it's literally the same role, right? That's why I said it also wouldn't apply to hunters. Like, if survival is the only spec that is good, and MM and BM are shit, then that would also suck. Like, I think for hunter, for example, I think survival should be good, and either BM or MM should be good. So you can stick to your role, right? But a rogue has three melee specs. Like, it's the same role. Just pick a different spec. <laughs> hmm. Atlas Reigns? <laughs> no, no, listen. Like, I'm obviously not saying that a spec should be bad. Like, obviously that is not what I'm saying. I'm perfectly content if all three specs are good or viable, right? Like, I'm not, I'm not trying to have Blizzard nerf two out of the three specs. <laughs> so only one of them is good, you know? <laughs> like, that's not what I mean. But I think it's a little bit of a different story when you talk about spec buffs. Because that's why I started this whole conversation, right? If you talk about spec buffs, then I think pure DPS classes that all have the same role, like Mage, Warlock, Rogue, then I think spec buffs make the least amount of sense. Because I don't think you necessarily have to encourage bringing different specs of that class. You know what I mean? At least I don't feel this way. Like, I don't feel like when I'm raiding, I don't think we need an Asa Rogue, an Outlaw Rogue, and a Sub Rogue in a raid. Like, I don't think that's, that's necessarily something that needs to be enforced by Blizzard. It's a different story with, like, more hybrid class if they have different roles. Like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind if a Survival Hunter has a spec buff to encourage bringing Survival Hunters. Because it makes sense to have a survival hunter and like a BM hunter. Because they are two different roles. Right? So it makes sense. And that's where spec buffs would make sense in my mind. So if a survival hunter brings a certain buff that an MM hunter doesn't bring, well then you bring a survival hunter and MM hunter and it's cool, right? So I think that class buffs make more sense for pure DPS specs. Like, I think a class buff makes a lot of sense for a mage, right? Because then you bring a mage, and it doesn't matter which one you bring, you might bring an arcane mage, or a frost mage, or a fire mage, and they all give you the intellect buff, right? And I think for a rogue, it would also make sense if they have a class buff. Because, again, they're all melee. Now, I think for a class like paladin, a class buff doesn't make as much sense. Because, think about red paladin, right? Holy Paladin, they have no issues getting into the raid. Like, Holy Paladins always have, like, a spot, really, right? 
And imagine Paladin would have a class buff. I mean, they do. They have AM, right? In a sense. Or they have, like, Devotion Aura, right? And then you almost always bring a Holy Paladin, but you never bring a Red Paladin, and you never really bring a Prop Paladin. And I think that's an issue, right? So that's what I mean. So if Red Paladin would have a specific spec buff, then that would help to get more Red Paladins into the, into the raids. But spec buff for pure DPS classes is a bit like, I don't care if I have an Astro Rogue in my raid or an Outlaw Rogue, and I certainly don't want to have all three rogues in my raids. I don't want to have three rogues. Because we have such, we have so many melee specs. Now imagine we would always bring three rogues. Like that's fucked up, yeah? Because bringing three paladins is not as fucked up, right? If you bring one prop paladin, one red paladin, one holy paladin, well then so be it, right? They're all different roles, whatever. But bringing three rogues is a different story. They're all melee, like... <laughs> Maybe I don't want four druids in my right? I mean, even four druids wouldn't be... Like, if you bring one guardian druid, one feral druid, one moonkin, and one rested druid, that wouldn't even be considered class stacking in my mind. Like, I wouldn't even be so upset about that. But if you bring four warlocks, I kind of would be upset about that, I think. Because that is, that is certainly a bit different in my mind. Because usually when you... Like, usually you main a role and not necessarily a class, I think. At least... At least a lot of players do, right? Like, if I'm a ranged DPS player, I am a ranged DP Like, I don't, I, I don't main druids. Like, when I'm raiding, my raid leader doesn't tell me, Hey, Nagura, can you play guardian in this boss? Like, no. <laughs> right? I, I'm not a druid main. I play moonkin, right? And if I have to play a different range or a different uh, class or anything different on another boss, I would just play a different range DPS. Like I would play Warlock or Mage or Hunter or whatever. I wouldn't start playing Feral or Rested Druid, right? Because I'm, I'm a range DPS main, I'm not a Druid main. And it's a bit different if you're a Mage, right? Because if you're a Mage, then all of your three specs are ranged specs. And then it kind of makes more sense for you to play fire on one boss, frost on the other boss, arcane on the other boss. You know, it's like kind of makes sense. But it doesn't make sense for a red paladin to play holy paladin all of a sudden. <laughs> like, <laughs> That's what Blizzard wants to get away from. Your druid first, moonkin second. But you're saying they want that to not happen? I, I don't see how that could be a thing in WoW. I honestly don't think that someone should ever be like a druid main. Because it just doesn't make sense with the way classes work in World of Warcraft. Like there's some classes who have three different roles or even four different roles. And other classes only have one role. Like it just doesn't make sense to... To kind of encourage maining a class. Why not? Well, because it would make sense to encourage players to main a class if all classes would have similar amount of roles within their specs. But like, how is a druid supposed to learn all four roles while a mage only has to learn one role? Like, it's a, it's a pretty big difference. Right? Like, it just doesn't work. And not only is it a lot harder to learn different roles, I think it's also a lot harder to um, to make that work in like a social point of view, right? Because if you're in a guild 
and all of your players are maining a class instead of a role, then how on earth are you gonna like figure that out in the raids? <laughs> like, if all of a sudden all of your hybrid classes say, "Oh, I'm I'm playing tank now," then you have seven tanks, or what? You know what I mean? Like that doesn't really work. <laughs> That's why you usually main a role and not a class. If you play in top 100 guild, you're good enough to play whatever. No, that's wrong. That's wrong. If you, if you, if you play in any guild, you can't just switch your role. Unless, uh, <laughs> unless your raid leader like somehow agrees and you're missing someone, right? I don't think this has anything to do with top guilds because even if you're in a top 1000 guild, if you have two tanks, then a third person cannot say, I'm tanking now. Like, you understand that, right? <laughs> I can't just be like, oh, hey, I'm just gonna play Guardian now. Hey. And then what are the other two tanks are gonna do? Like, they're just gonna be like, okay, I guess I'm gonna play healer. And then one of the healers like, oh, well, guess if you play healer, then I'm gonna go damage the healer. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's just not really how it works, right? If you're just pugging or whatever, then obviously you can play whatever role you want, then you can just um, uh, switch it around. But if you're in a guild, you can't just like randomly switch your role around, like that just doesn't work. Lots of people try to change roles between seasons. Okay, now we're just nitpicking. We totally understand what I'm trying to say. I think now we're just like arguing for the sake of arguing, right? It's just true that it's problematic to change roles. Like it's much more problematic to change roles than it is to change spec within the same role. That's a fact, right? It's not impossible to change roles, but obviously it's more difficult to make that work compared to changing specs. And that's that's just my point. And yeah. I just don't think that spec buffs for pure DPS classes uh, are very good. If there are spec classes, I think it should be specs that are part of a hybrid class, I think. I think that makes a lot more sense, personally. You might disagree, but, uh, you know. Three, yeah, imagine, <laughs> imagine each Warlock spec would have a different raid buff. <laughs> that would be so messed up. Imagine you bring a goddamn Diamond Warlock, a Flexion Warlock, a Destro Warlock to your raids. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. I'm not saying that pure DPS classes shouldn't have a class buff. I'm just saying that it probably should be in the, sp in the class tree rather than the spec tree because, because of all the things I just mentioned. But yeah, if you disagree, then you disagree. If you think that uh, it would make sense to encourage bringing three different rogue specs, I understand that too if you think that way, right? I get that. I personally don't think that way, but <laughs> I see why you would uh, care. <laughs> I just do so much damage that I pull threat and become the tank if I want to tank. <laughs> I personally... I personally very much hate raid buffs or spec buffs or any kind of buffs at all. And people always bring up the argument that guilds would just stack certain classes. But I always ask myself, why do you care? <laughs> Seriously. Like, let's say they race to world first. Let's say Liquid would bring 10 rogues to a boss. Then what? How does that like negatively affect you?
If the boss is... If the boss is uh, perfectly fine to kill with any other comp. Like, let's say you don't need 10 rogues to kill a boss, but a top guild does it anyway, because it's just, like, slightly beneficial to them. It's fun to watch someone play your class back. Yeah, I got that, but do we have to change? Because... Because what's the, what's the argument for class buffs? The argument for class buffs, or at least this is what I always hear, people always say that otherwise guilds would just stack classes, right? And then I always wonder who? Who would stack classes if there was no class buffs? Well, probably just the top guilds, right? I don't think a top 100 guild would end up stacking 10 Warlocks. Like, why? Probably not, right? Unless they're, like, super OP. And that's just a balancing thing, right? So if the balance is somewhat reasonable, then I don't think there, wouldn't be, there would not be many guilds that would class stack. It would only really be, like, the cutting-edge guilds that can afford to class stack that have players that are really good at multi-classing or whatever, right? And all the other guilds probably wouldn't really class stack. And honestly, class buffs actually have a lot of negativity that it that they cause as well that some people don't seem to think about sometimes. Because if you're in a top guild, I don't think Liquid gives a single fuck about class buffs, because they can bring whatever the hell they want. So they'll just bring a rogue, they'll bring a mage, they'll bring a priest. They don't care, they bring whatever, right? Because they can bring anything they want. All of their players play everything. They couldn't care less about class buffs, they'll just bring the players, right? Now the people that do care are guilds that cannot do that, right? Like if you're in a top 100 guild, top 200 guild, whatever, and you you only had one mage player, and now the mage player, like, got sick, or stopped playing WoW, or whatever. Okay, now what? Now you don't have a mage player anymore. Now you're missing an intellect buff, right? So you have to force and find a new mage, instead of uh, being able to raid properly without one, right? So I do honestly think that class buffs hurt casual guilds way more then they hurt top guilds. The only thing that top guilds have to do um, with class buffs is bring different classes. But as I said, like it's not really an issue for them to do that. So <laughs> it's like, they don't care. And yeah, it prevents them from class stacking really, or at least it prevents them from class stacking heavily. But I just don't really see how that affects everyone so negatively if they would class stack. That they would have to change it. Pax will only take the top classes because why would you not? Spec slash class buffs? Mm, yeah. I, I think I agree on you with that one. If, if class buffs would not exist then it's possible that when you're pugging that they would only invite like the classes that the top guilds are stacking i can definitely see that but i i also have a feeling that um usually when it comes to pugging in raids then i think people aren't as picky compared to how it is in plus right and Correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I don't pug a lot of raiding. I pug a lot of M+, but I don't really do raid pugging. But I always had a feeling that whenever you're raiding, people don't necessarily care as much about your class, really. At least I've never seen that before. Like, I've never seen a Shadow Priest not get invited because it's a Shadow Priest. Like, people used to just invite people that have the experience and the item level. So I'm not sure if the class buffs are really that impactful for pucks. In pug and in a plus, class buffs affect us very negatively, actually. In pucks, um, in mythic plus, there are certain class buffs you kind of need, and then 
classes that don't provide those buffs have a disadvantage, right? So I honestly, whenever I think of class buffs, like the greater picture of class buffs always has much more negativity involved with it than positive effects in my mind. So that's why I, if, I, if it was for me, I would remove all of the class buffs. <laughs> the only class buffs, or I don't want to say class buffs, the only thing that I really like is class utility. Because I do think uh, class utility is, is a much cooler way of enforcing certain class diversity than um, class buffs. For example, a Warlock Gateway. I think a Warlock Gateway is like a really, really cool way of kind of enforcing you to bring Warlocks. But it's not a damage gain, right? So you don't have to bring a Warlock, but sometimes a boss fight becomes a lot easier if you have a Gateway. And then there's also certain fights where you don't need a gateway, but it's nice to have it. And that, in my opinion, that's the perfect way of kind of like uh, encouraging players to bring different classes. Yeah, something like DK Grip, um, Gateway, even something like Shroud, but for M+, of course. And I wish classes would have more stuff like that. Or also something like Stampeding Roar or Windrush Totem. Like, these kind of things, in my opinion, are much, much more interesting than intellect buff. You know, it's like, you click a fucking button and everyone just more damage. Great, you know? It's like, oh, how satisfying. I just pressed Mark of the Wilds, you know? <laughs> like, oh, That is so much more boring than putting down a gateway and the whole raid, like, using it to avoid a mechanic. Like, that just feels so much more satisfying. <laughs> Vodrin, yes. <sighs> okay, guys, anyway, I'm gonna have to leave you for today. Uh, thank you very much for the discussion. I love talking about this stuff. Uh, <laughs> sorry that I insulted your pure DPS specs. I'm very sorry. If you are an Arcane Mage main, then I do apologize. If you are an Affliction Warlock ma main, I also apologize. You are not a bad player. Unless... <laughs> anyway. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you so much for watching, guys. Um, we're gonna have to look at a lot more talents um, so we still have a lot to figure out on beta, we have to, or alpha. We have to look at professions, we have to look at the rest of the talents that we didn't look at, like Priest, uh, Hunter, and the other rogue specs as well. And... And DK. So look at DK as well. So yeah, we're, we're gonna do all of that on Monday. I'm not gonna stream tomorrow or on Sunday. I'm gonna enjoy my weekend. I hope you all enjoy your weekend as well. And, uh... Whenever we have these kind of discussions, don't take me too seriously, yeah? Sometimes when I say I, I think you suck or you're bad at the game, then usually I'm just memeing, yeah? Because <laughs> I'm bad at the game. Don't worry about it. It's like, <laughs> I wouldn't call anyone else bad if I wouldn't think I'm bad myself. We're, we're like all, we're all the same guys. Don't worry about it. <laughs> all right. Uh, thank you so much for watching. Uh, let me go and host somebody. Remember to follow my stream if you haven't yet. That would be super, super nice. And I will upload a video soon about the whole Munkin rant that I had earlier. So if you guys are interested in my thoughts on the current problems with Munkin, then check out my YouTube. We're going to upload that soon. And I'm also going to upload Season 4 Dungeon Guides. Um, from like next ID onwards. So make sure you follow my YouTube. Because uh, I think the season four dungeons are definitely something that people have forgotten about, right? So I'm making guides that are pretty pretty in depth, but not too long. I'm trying to focus on M plus strategies a lot, like I'm basically talking about tips and tricks on how to deal with certain trash mechanics and certain boss mechanics, and I think it should be really interesting. I did a lot of research because I honestly forgot a lot about the dungeons as well. 
so I watched a lot of like old videos of people doing high end plus in like Karasan and junkyard workshop, all this stuff. And I like wrote together like the most important things about it and then putting it all into videos. So if you guys care about M plus and you want to get a refresher in all those dungeons, then just check out my YouTube. It's going to, I'm going to be uploading it very soon. Uh, yeah, we should host Aya. Aya is uh, playing Alpha as well, so that's perfect. Hold on, I need to pull up a uh, retail. Wow. <gasps> I don't even have she needs to pull up retail. Wow, no, 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 no retail. That's not allowed. Oh, she's doing dances with makes and Relo? Nice. Why did no one invite me? I like my brain gets <laughs> broken with like. Uh, what the default. hell? Well, I wouldn't have joined anyway because I had to look at talents, but. <laughs> default stuff. <laughs> I still would have liked to be asked, That's what so I, I can let them down. Like you know, when it's, when it's vertical like, or horizontal like that, I literally I would, get, like, would have liked to say very no. Hi. <laughs> mm -hmm. She asked into the first. Oh, I see. Okay, okay. <laughs> they asked into the. Okay, I didn't see that. <laughs> it's not. No, no, no. It's it's not that I need more buttons. It's that like I use bartenders so that. They are Alright guys, thank you so much for watching. Have an awesome oh, weekend. Play a lot of video um, games. And uh, like drink like this. whatever and, you uh, like to drink. Just not too much of it. I, well, like unless it's water. When they're then you're like allowed to drink vertical. as much as you want. So. <laughs> and have a good time. I'll see you guys on Monday. If you want to know what I'm doing on the weekend, well, you can check I'm my like, Instagram I, story. I usually post up there. Put this on window. There we go. Goodbye guys. Thanks for watching. It feels, Bye. It feels so wrong. Whoa.